Good on white balance. I don't. I don't see. I don't see it moving right immediately. Um, but uh, I can guess it might happen maybe like, uh, soon, but not like not like right now. No yeah. Check one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. A B C D E F G H I J K L M N O P Q R S T U V W X Y Z.
governor is there as well, the Burnsville mayor, Burnsville police chief, the fire chief, and many other people there for this uh, uh, news conference. Let's go ahead and take that again. This happened early this morning, around 5.30 this morning in the city of Burnsville, where three first responders, two police officers, and a fireman paramedic were killed while responding to a domestic. Let's go ahead and listen in as soon as they get situated here. And just to give a little bit more context, we know the first call came out a little before two in the morning to a residential neighborhood in uh, Burnsville. And then they were trying to negotiate with the person who was barricaded inside. It looks like they've started the news conference. Let's go ahead and listen in. My name is Greg Lindbergh. I'm the city manager here in Burnsville. And um, it's been a difficult an emotional day uh, here for our community and our team. I thank you all for being with us today uh, as we share some important information on a critical incident that occurred in our community this morning. Today, uh, we'll have several updates for you. Uh, first, Drew Evans from the BCA will provide an update on the critical incident that occurred. Uh, and then both our police chief and our fire chief um, we'll make comments uh, about this difficult day in our team, in our family here in Burnsville. Um, words can't express how hard today has been. Um, we know that people want and need information, and that's our role in providing good government and good service uh, to the community. And we want to also make sure that we take good care of our team the people who serve this community day in and day out, and their families. So thank you for giving us the grace and the patience and the understanding to inform their loved ones, to take care of our team, um, and to even process this ourselves. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Evans with the BCA. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And we've been asked to investigate this matter, and I'll provide a quick update. Uh, first, um, you know, thank you on behalf of uh, the team here for all the law enforcement support, um, the governor's support, the commissioner of public safety support, uh, for everybody that's having just an incredibly difficult day. This is really a terrible day for the city of Burnsville, all of the residents, the law enforcement and fire communities that are mourning the loss of these uh, public servants that occurred early today. At approximately 1.50 a.m. on February 18th, uh, Burnsville police were called to a residence in the 12,600 block of 33rd Avenue South on a report of a domestic situation where a man was reported to be armed and barricaded with family members in the home. We later learned uh, that there were seven young children in the home, uh, ranging from ages 2 to 15 at the time of this event occurred. When officers got to the scene, the individual was barricaded, and they spent quite a bit of time uh, negotiating with this individual who was barricaded in the home, and additional officers responded um, at that time. At one point during that barricaded situation, uh, the uh, subject uh, opened fire on the officers in the home. And officers Elmstrad, Rugi, and Finseth for the fire department, uh, Mr. Finseth, were killed by the gunman during the response. One other officer, Sergeant Adam Medlicott, was injured and was shot uh, as well, where he's suffered non-life-threatening injuries, um, but has been treated, is in the process of being treated. At approximately 8 a.m., the subject was reported to be deceased in the home, and later that morning, those other children and family members were able to escape from the home. Residents were, are asked to allow our teams uh, to uh, stay away from the area and allow our teams uh, to complete the crime scene investigation that needs to occur in that location still at this time. Uh, I'm going to go through quickly just a little bit of background on the officers before I uh, turn it over to Police Chief Schwartz that, and, and, and about who they are. Uh, Paul Elmstrand is 
27 and joined the Burnsville Police Department in August of 2017, first as a community service officer, and he was later promoted to officer in July of 2019. He was part of the department's mobile command staff, peer team, honor guard, and field training unit. Officer Matthew Rugi, age 27, joined the Burnsville Police Department in April of 2020. He was part of the department's crisis negotiations team was a, uh, and was a physical evidence officer. And then firefighter Adam Finseth, uh, age 40, has been a Burnsville firefighter paramedic since 2019. As they noted, we're in the very beginning stages of this investigation. I know everybody wants to know exactly what occurred and, and really what led up to these really terrible event that occurred today. I'd ask that you have patience as we work through that. We'll piece together everything that we can to provide the answers in due time. Or at this time, we're providing these basic updates so that we can uh, show you just a little bit of what occurred. We'll answer a few questions at the conclusion of this, uh, but we're, our crime scene will be active and ongoing uh, in that process. I will note just a few things uh, in this uh, in terms of the questions. We still don't know the uh, exact exchange of gunfire uh, that occurred. Uh, certainly uh, several officers uh, did uh, return fire. I will note that this individual had uh, several guns and large amounts of ammunition and shot at the police officers from multiple positions within the home uh, in that incident. And the exact timing and cadence of what occurred will be part of our active investigation as we review video, officers, uh, body cams, uh, video that might be in the area, conduct interviews and all available evidence to really figure out exactly what occurred in this incident. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Police Chief uh, Tanya Schwartz. Thank, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a hard day. It's a really hard day for our public safety family. We're hurting. Okay, we're hurting. Today, three members of our team made the ultimate sacrifice for this community. They are heroes. Our police officers and our fire paramedics, they come to work every day they do it willingly. They know that they might have to give up their life for their partners, for someone else. They know they have to give up their life sometime. And they do it anyways. And you cannot understand it if you're not in the profession. Every day we want them to go home to their families. Every day we pray that they go home to their families. And today that's not happening. We are all hurting. Our officers, our fire department, our families, all of our staff, our community. We're heartbroken. We are heartbroken. We are going to need time to be together. Please. Our families need time to grieve. They need time to be together. We need you to pray for them. That's what we need right now. Superintendent Evan shared a little bit about each of the officers. I will just share that Officer Paul Elmstrand was with the department for six years and six months. Officer Matthew Rugi with the police department for three years and ten months. Sergeant Adam Medlicott, who's expected to survive with the department for nine years and five months. We talk about it often here in Burnsville. We're a family. We take care of each other. And days like today is so important. So I'm gonna turn it over to my brother, the fire department, Chief Jungman, and he is gonna speak about the fire department family. Good afternoon. I am BJ Jungman. I'm the fire chief for the city of Burnsville. This is the toughest day that the city of Burnsville and our public safety family has ever experienced. My hearts and prayers go out to the families who lost a loved one in the line of duty today. Our folks come to work every day 
and are willing to give up the ultimate sacrifice of their life, but no one expects it to happen. It's a tragic day. We're all grieving, and we're all trying to understand what happened and why. I would like to share a little bit of information about firefighter paramedic, the firefighter paramedic we lost in the line of duty today. Firefighter paramedic Adam Finseth, badge 83, was one of our SWAT paramedics um, and has been in the fire department for five years. He also served the city of Savage and the city of Hastings prior to coming to work at the city of Burnsville. No matter how much we try to understand that, there are no words to describe these public safety, to these public safety officer families what they're going through right now. Our Burnsville community, including our city staff and police and fire families, are grieving. We ask the media to respect the families and their privacy as they are processing this information. We thank our mutual aid partners who responded to the incidents and are helping us during this difficult time. We've had an outpouring of support through our community, which we greatly appreciate. And at this time, we'd ask our community to support each other and help each other grieve. We'd ask them to respect the families that lost someone today. We ask everybody to show grace and understanding for our community members and our city staff who are impacted by this. We're gonna provide more information moving forward um, and how you can support these families financially in the coming days. I would ask you to go to burnsvillemn.gov slash community updates and we will keep you informed there. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to our city manager to close, uh, Greg Lindbergh. Chiefs, thank you. Um, Chief Swartz, Schwartz said it best. Uh, just now, we're hurting as a team and as a family, uh, particularly for those individuals who have chosen our police and our fire departments as a career to serve this community and to, to live out day to day what is one of the most important things here in Burnsville, and that's keeping our community safe. Um, we're going to support each other. Uh, we're going to care for one another as a team because we talk a lot about in this organization and as a family that if we take care of each other, that's when we can best care for our community. And we're going to do that, and it's going to be hard. We'll support our staff the best that we can in the coming days. We also will make sure that you have all of the information that you need to help us do the same. I'd ask uh, that you use uh, the website burnsvillemn.gov slash community updates where we'll be posting all of the information uh, that we share with the community and beyond as we work together to continue to support each other to care for the community. And speaking of caring for the community, I I'd invite all of you our community and beyond uh, to attend an informal vigil tonight outside of City Hall where we'll join together and start the process of grieving uh, and caring for each other in our support to strengthen our community and to make sure uh, that our team, our staff, the people who call Burnsville home and beyond know that together um, we will create uh, a safe community and one where we can all work together in caring for each other. And finally, um, the Chiefs and I are, are going to return to the business of taking care of our family and taking care of our community really thank you for the time that you spent here today and, and appreciate uh, your, your willingness uh, to, to join us. So thank you very much. We can do just a couple questions. It's early in the investigation as a few, but we'll try to answer if we keep them to the investigation as we let them go back and continue. Yes, um, 
No, it's a good question. We're still piecing that together right now. Um, I can tell you at least one of the officers was shot inside of the home. The other two uh, that were deceased, we're still uh, piecing together if it was inside or outside of the home. But I can tell you that officer uh, that took fire inside of the home and once they were outside of the home. So the paramedic was piece of part of the team. The SWAT team was called to this incident, and they were in the process of helping resolve that. And as part of that, they have paramedics that are assigned to that team, and they were assisting uh, with uh, the, the officer, uh, the first one that was injured. Thanks for your update. Adrian Bronis from NBC News, eight-year Minnesota resident. Have you all been called to that home before? So we're still working through all of that. Uh, the home, um, there was at this particular residence with this individual, there had not been many calls for service at all. The domestic situation that brought officers there, can you elaborate on that at all? Uh, at this time, it's part of the active investigation. We can't provide any more information than what we've had. So the suspect. Suspect is deceased, as we noted in this particular instance, and he is, um, uh, as a part of that, the medical examiner will do the official identification. We believe we know who the individual is, but the official identification needs to come from the medical office, medical examiner's office. We're working through that right now. The medical examiner will provide that. That autopsy will occur tomorrow. So uh, that a vehicle that you saw was used as part of the SWAT team that was on scene um, as the or shortly after the gunfire erupted and was used as part of that process, which is why it was shot. Are there any requests for extreme risk protection orders against the suspect? Uh, we're still part of the active investigation at this time. Yeah. Well, certainly, you know, seven children inside of the home uh, from, you know, ages 15 to 2, it's a very uh, troubling situation for everybody involved in this particular incident, and, and we're uh, glad they aren't uh, hurt as part of this. Who was able to call for help? So a, a resident that was inside of the residence made the initial call. What can you tell us about the gun? So we'll still, we'll be able to provide more information about that later on. I will say there were multiple firearms recovered from inside of the residence. And you said you were going to take a few more questions. Are yep. you all done? I, I maybe take one more. I understand that he shot out the second story window. Is that true? Yes, yeah, so there was shooting that came from the upper portion of the residence and on the main floor of the residence as well. So thank you for your time. We'll provide more information as we can from there. Thanks. All right, the last person to speak there was uh, Drew Evans from the BCA, uh, supervising this now BCA investigation as well. I'm um, talking about exactly at least what he could talk about because it is an active investigation about what occurred there. The governor now also taking to the podium, offering his condolences. Let's listen in. Of Adam, Paul, and Matt, Minnesota mourns with you. Uh, state stands ready to assist in any way possible. You've seen from BCA, Commissioner Jacobson, the state patrol, of course, assisting in ways that they can. but. That's just not today and tomorrow, it's for years to come. And I think for Minnesotans to recognize um, families that are shattered by something like this forever that'll ever change it. A huge thank you to the city of Burnsville. I've been on the phone a couple of times today with Mayor Kautz. Um, she too is heartbroken. There's no one more proud of this great city than her and advocating for it and to have this happen is, is tragic. And to the, the folks who stand up here, Burnsville Fire, Burnsville Police, but all of our partners in the area, this is a very small fraternity when it gets down to it, and everybody knows everybody. And I think you heard that, the, the ages of, of these officers and, and this paramedic firefighter, uh, young folks. And uh, this will start to ripple across the state, and I would just ask again, echo the chief's response, keep these families in your prayers, let this investigation play itself out. And I, and I would just say, if I could, to ask Minnesotans, this week you'll see the flags flying at half staff. Um, that's a sign of respect and mourning, but it's a time to give each of us, as you drive by one of those flags, to maybe pause and think about these first responders, these, these public safety officials. They're moms and dads, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters. They're the world to a lot of people, and they go out and do the job to provide us safety that we have the luxury of not having to think about many times. Um, and then this can happen. And I think it's really just important in this time uh, to focus on that, to focus um, where they're at and to, to think about this and to recognize it's, 
this is not going to go away in the next few weeks. It's not going to go away when an investigation's done. These families are forever impacted. And we still have Minnesotans willing to take an oath, sign up, do the work, and know this can happen. And, and that speaks volumes about this community, speaks volumes about Minnesotans. So, so thank you all for, uh, for taking the time to cover it. Yeah, and if one is too many, and yes, and I, you know, I, I hesitate to say this is the darkest day in, in Minnesota law enforcement history because every time we, we lose an officer, and we saw this, we saw multiple shooting, been up in Fargo, and we know we had a tragic situation, and yes, the, this is heartbreaking. And um, it, it, I said I'm still trying to comprehend the loss of three in this, and a firefighter um, is just just really difficult and this this is hard work this is really hard work and I think for Minnesotans to understand um, what these folks do every single day that's why it's really important we make sure we uh, we put them in the best position possible to do their jobs Governor Walls we know we have a shortage of officers at varying departments across the state to those who wear the badge or are even considering and seeing this and say I don't want to yeah. I don't know if I can do that what do you say to them yeah, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I think there's, uh, when it comes to public service and public safety, it, it's in the hearts and it's in the souls of the folks who do it. Um, but we have a responsibility to make sure we're doing everything possible to equip them, train them, and support them in that work. Um, but they'll continue to they'll continue to do it, and I think it's just that sense of gratitude. And you're going to feel it over this week in, in a big way. Minnesota's going to mourn, and they're going to mourn very publicly. I think that's the time where... Folks who are thinking about being in this recognize how important we know these people are. This is this is noble work, and so I, I do I I'm concerned because when we have a shortage, it makes it more difficult for those who are in to do their job. And so anything we can do to get them in, I I hope they continue to know the state of Minnesota, and certainly our communities are there to support them. But. Thank Listening in to a news conference in Burnsville today as we continue to follow this developing story of three first responders who were killed in the line of duty responding to a domestic call early this morning. Those officers' names, Paul Elmstrand with the Burnsville Police Department, Matthew Ruge with the Burnsville Police Department, Adam Finseth with the Burnsville Fire Department, and also those three were killed. Also, Sergeant Adam Medlicott injured in this, and he has non-life-threatening injuries. Here's what we learned in this news conference. This call began shortly before 2 a.m. and they were negotiating with this barricaded suspect and at least one of those officers was killed inside the home. Um, un unsure how it played out after that, but these officers were taking fire from several different locations. They said this, this suspect, this gunman was firing from the second floor and also the first floor. And many guns were recovered at the scene. So there were a lot of guns and ammunition. Um, as this started with a family in an emergency, seven children and a woman inside this home with this barricaded gunman. We also learned that uh, the paramedic firefighter that uh, died, Adam Finseth there, was actually assisting one of the officers who'd been hit by that gunfire when he was killed as well. Um, we heard from several city officials today, and you most notably saw the governor there at the end who um, sort of summed it up for all of us by saying this is, uh, this is something where we need to pray for our communities and pray for uh, the loved ones of those killed today. And, and, and in many ways, we need to mourn publicly about this um, and show our support uh, to the Burnsville community. The fire uh, police chief also, Tanya Schwartz, uh, she said several times, we are hurting, meaning their community and uh, the uh, camaraderie of the department, uh, both fire and police are hurting. Uh, called those three individuals heroes, which absolutely they are. And, and let's not forget the injured uh, officer as well. Um, City Manager Greg Lindbergh, uh, very heartfelt, very broken up by all of this. Um, words cannot express what that community is feeling. Um, did say there'll be a vigil tonight around 6.30, yes. so anybody from the community or any community that wants to take part in that at the Burnsville City Hall are welcome for that as well. And the governor saying in his closing remarks there, the flags will be flying at half staff this week. And that is the suspect home. This is the first view we've had 
of the home that was involved. And you can see the, the windows um, broken out on the second floor there. This is the scene of where all of this took place in the early morning hours this morning. So those tire tracks you see going up toward the house, undoubtedly that was the uh, SWAT vehicle that was making its way toward the house when it took fire into that windshield. The, uh, the uh, BCA announced that that's essentially how they were able to um, approach that home. They took fire from that upstairs window in several other locations. as. Kelsey noted at the same time, we also need to remember that there were seven children and another adult in that uh, home along with the suspect at the time uh, that this all came down. Again, 1.50 a.m. was the first call. The suspect was not considered down until 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, the officers, we believe, were shot around 5.30 a.m. Um, and it is unclear the exchange of gunfire right now, as they alluded to in the news conference. All of that is under investigation. So the suspect is dead, but um, figuring out, you know, which shot came from where that killed him, that will all be taken care of in an autopsy at the medical examiner's office tomorrow. Uh, and again, the locations of the officers and and how they were performing their duties when all of this happened, um, still very much under investigation. Uh, but, you know, the, the police chief saying, you know, every day we pray that they go home to their families. Yeah. But when you sign up to be a law enforcement officer, you know that it is possible that you might have to make the ultimate sacrifice. And um, everybody in that news conference reminding uh, the people out there today just the courage that it takes to sign up for a job like this and to face that every single day. Um, as you go to work. We'll bring this all together for you um, on Fox Local, Fox 9, and of course on our website, fox9.com, uh, throughout the evening. Uh, first and foremost at 5 o'clock will be our first newscast as well. We'll stream that as well. But um, it should be noted there were essentially three components today, the actual event this morning, uh, followed by a very long and uh, heartfelt procession t from downtown Minneapolis HCMC where the bodies were taken to the medical examiner's office in Minnetonka. Uh, we covered that uh, mm -hmm. from its beginning to its end as well and now this uh, press briefing that we just received. We're going to put all that together and cover it uh, in all of our newscasts tonight. Yeah. So we will see you in 15 minutes at the top of the hour on Fox 9, Fox9.com and Fox Local. What if game is your respond? So elevated, elevated situations where a shooter could potentially position himself is a very high possibility. So you have to make note of that. So typically officers will not park in front of the house. They strategically make an approach while communicating with dispatch and or the reporting person to get the intel that they need. If they determine then at that point that it is a situation that deems uh, you, you know, you have victims inside or you potentially have a, you know, barricaded subject with hostages, well, then at that point, typically your, your first responders will just kind of back off, open lines of negotiation, and then uh, uh, summon and bring in a tactical response team uh, to ultimately negotiate. And once it turns into a potential situation where the violence is going to continue, then we're tasked with the responsibility of immediately making entry and neutralizing the threat. So then you got to expect all variables, not only from the residents itself, but even sur surrounding residents also, that's why you never go to these domestic situations alone and tr officers train constantly to make sure that they have all the tools available to uh, make the right observations as they're approaching the scene. We also learned that there were seven children inside of this residence, ranging in age from two to 15. And obviously, you can only imagine the, the panic that goes through a family's mind when there's somebody who is clearly not in the right state, like the suspect, who puts them in danger, their call for police. I mean, knowing all of these things, uh, in a lot of situations, Mark, that I can think of, when there's a barricaded suspect, in a lot of situations that I'm familiar with reporting on, the outcome isn't just that there is an officer shot, killed, or injured. A lot of times the family members also become victims, too. So uh, I guess just walk us through how they approach that, knowing that there could be kids inside, the family members, and, and having to deal with all these different pieces and how much worse this could have been. It could have been a lot, it could have been a lot worse, right? Um, what you're looking at is potentially, again, anytime you have potential hostages, uh, other family members that ultimately turn into hostages, you have to you have to know that going into it. Although you don't get all of that information when you approach the scene of a domestic violence, sometimes you don't get it until you're actually there. 
if you know that there's hostages in there, there's children, then what they're going to do is the first thing is that open line of negotiations. They're going to try to make a phone call with the individual inside to try to find out and identify uh, and empathize and try to figure out how they could resolve this by just having that simple dialogue and conversation. And that's typically the, the first step. But it's once the shots ring out, if there's any shots inside, then at that point, uh, officers have to make a decision, a split second decision as to what they're going to do. Now, I've had to make those split de decisions, split second decisions, where I've had to protect people inside as well. And I've actually had to attempt to breach an actual residence, which I was welcomed by gunfire. So these things, these things can happen. It's a risk. It's an inherited risk that we take. But you, hopefully you have all of your resources available to assist you. Other officers, backup officers, the tactical response team that is in route. And obviously, once, once a tactical team shows up, they pretty much take over uh, the entire scene and deploy all of their training strategies, strategies and techniques that they need to mitigate the risk. Well, and you mentioned your own experience, Mark, and I do want to ask you about that because that just helps really provide such great perspective here for viewers who are tuning in right now. When it comes to that strategy and the training that goes into it, walk us through how that has helped you in previous situations. I mean, anytime there is a domestic call, you know that it's dangerous, you know what you're walking into and, and how tragic things can turn. But I, I just want to ask you about your own experience and how the strategy and training that you did helped you in, in those situations. Listen, the officers undergo, including myself, we undergo a lot of specialized training to prepare, prepare for domestic violence situations that could ultimately escalate and put emergency responders and officers at risk. So receiving education on the dynamics of the domestic violence situation is something that I really took a, a more active role and active interest in. Um, understanding the tactics that a, per a perpetrator would potentially use uh, the impact of trauma on the victims as well. These are all the things that the training that we go through and understanding uh, that what helps officers recognize the complexities of these, of these situations and informing all of us on what are good solid response uh, strategies based on what we've encountered in the past. So the, the past experience that I've had allowed me to really fine tune uh, my ability to respond and know that in every domestic situation, I'm assuming worst case scenario. That's why officers go through what we call uh, reality-based or scenario-based training. It's actually putting them in a controlled environment in those conditions. This exercises the officers to practice a response in, in that controlled environment. And they identify all of the areas for improvement. What's the best way to respond to the, the different conditions that they could potentially encounter at a domestic? So I've learned a lot of things as a result. And, and, and we're going to learn a lot from this particular situation. All of the officers are going to, uh, and the emergency responders are going to know and understand the importance now of that cohesiveness and that coordinated approach between your fire and police. They're two separate entity, uh, entities that have a focus of protecting life at the end of the day, and there needs to be that coordinated effort. Hence, is what you had, what you had here. And again, it is an assumed level of risk. Anytime you, you put on the uniform, whether you're a firefighter or you're a, uh, a police officer. My son being a firefighter, uh, Ryan, he's, uh, you know, we have these discussions all the time as, as well. So it's, it's an inherited risk that you take, but we learn from past uh, incidents that uh, how can we do better next time to assure the safety and well-being of not just us, but the victims and those that are inside the home, including the perpetrator as well, because ideally we want 100% resolve with no fatalities and no injuries whatsoever. And we also learned there, the, the rest of this is still under investigation, but they were able to share that at least one of the officers was shot inside of the home. They're still trying to piece together where the firefighter and emergency responder, as well as the other officer were shot. And there's an additional officer too, I, I want to add as well, that was injured and is expected to recover. And so knowing that one of them was inside of the home, Walk us through that approach and, and what you expect to learn about the other two first responders in this once they complete this investigation. It seems to me, Lexi, that the first officer that had responded actually was able to get inside the home, right? So they let him in. Someone, it almost sounds like somebody let him in to start that investigation. And maybe while he was in there, it seems like the other two officers responded. And it's very possible in many occasions you respond to these situations and a family member lets you in. It could have been a child, could have been anyone, but yet the perpetrator is still inside the home. You don't know where he's at. 
And it's very possible and likely that maybe he was upstairs at that given time when the other officers arrived. Maybe he heard the conversation below between the officer and and whoever was downstairs, and, and it became an ambush situation at that point when the other officers responded. He fired out of that second store window, maybe came downstairs. And again, it's all speculative, but it's just based on the information we have. We can kind of speculate and try to identify and piece what could have happened, but the investigation is going to solidify exactly what took place. So if I'm inside the home, I've got to be very hyperly vigilant and know that there, the threat could potentially be inside. There could be other victims. So it's my responsibility to get as much information from the individual that I'm talking to. And sometimes it's best to even try to get them and remove them and pull them outside, uh, which is, is something that, that I would always do is get them outside of the house. And that, re- that creates a little bit of distance between me and anyone that could be in the house until I can get the intel that I need. And it's easy for police officers, it's easier for them to back off open lines of negotiation and go in if there's no imminent threat inside the house. If there's imminent threat in the house, then that requires uh, a rapid deployment. Unlike Valde, this requires a rapid deployment to neutralize the threat. You know, when we were on this live coverage earlier, along with our team at Fox 9 in Minneapolis, who was covering this from so many different angles today, there was uh, one piece of video that really struck me along with what we heard from neighbors and people who were in the area when all of this was happening and it had to do with this video we'll pull it up right now of one of the vehicles that was used here and take a look at just how many bullets how many rounds hit the windshield here of the vehicle that that was on scene there and so we've here we've been hearing that there's a lot of ammunition that was at the scene they're still trying to piece together the weapon or weapons that were used but I mean just seeing this visual alone mark what does that tell you about the potential uh, the potential amount of weapons that this suspect had on hand it tells me that he definitely he definitely had intentions of knowing that there was going to be a police response he did have intentions of not allowing the responders to, to make it up to the door or up to the house for the most part so he it looks like he fired about six rounds into that armored vehicle uh, that that right there makes it a very hostile uh, an intense situation and one that requires either an immediate tactical response to breach the residence to protect the victims inside if you have that information or to simply back off and establish a perimeter and start establishing lines of communication but clearly what you're looking at there is if he was able to fire six rounds into an uh, at an armored vehicle obviously it doesn't look like it penetrated Imagine what that would have done to a police unit if the police unit would have pulled up. Now, the armored ve- vehicle is specialized. You know, it's it's you're, it's going to be hard to penetrate that armored vehicle, but a police unit, it's it's going to be a little bit easier. So again, it could have been an officer arriving at the scene, but at that point, that tells you that it's a very hostile condition, hostile situation. So we need to establish and determine how can we best make entry uh, to neutralize and eliminate this threat. Yeah, thank you for explaining. I had a, a couple of questions about that, but really that video is is so striking. And then the initial call for this domestic violence incident, it came in around 1.50 in the morning, according to police. They then said that the suspect was found dead around 8 o'clock in the morning. And so how do they approach that situation too? Thinking the suspect might be down, may have ran, may have uh, potentially use the gun on himself, whatever the situation is, how do they know when it's safe to actually enter the residence? That is a good question and one that I actually encountered where I actually had a gang member put a weapon to my head as I was approaching uh, the front door and I was at a window. He fired at me. Um, he missed me by inches, right? And we fired back. And the bottom line is that we still remained outside, established a perimeter, and continued to call him out, knowing that we assumed that there were no one else inside because we couldn't hear anything, we had no more intel, but we called this individual out for at least an hour or two. It becomes the, the department's discre- at the department's discretion and your tactical teams to determine at what point do we need to make entry. If it's just him and we don't suspect anyone else in there, time is on our side. But if it's, if it's a single intruder, at that point, You've got to at some point make entry, and that's what we did. We went in, obviously the individual was deceased, but you really don't have a lot of information, and it's almost a roll of the dice if you don't have intel from somebody that is actually reporting it at that given moment time 
to dispatch from inside the house, if that if that makes sense. Yeah, and, and thank you for sharing about your own experience, too. It's incredibly scary, and I can't imagine the things that you've experienced, too, just like these brave first responders today, the danger that they put themselves through to protect that family and, and the people that were in the area there as well. And, you know, we heard from different officials today at that news conference talking about this. The emotion was so evident in their faces. They're, they're all grieving. They're going to be going through this for a long time. And you heard the governor at the end say there, too, that the investigation is going to wrap at some point, but these families, their lives are forever changed. One of the officials saying that this was one of the toughest, if not the toughest day ever experienced in their law enforcement uh, history that they can think of. And so obviously they're, they're all going through so much right now. But when you talk about departments as a whole, and I believe this was also asked to the governor too, and he didn't really have much to say on it because it's true. But when you think about these departments, so many of them are having trouble retaining staff and recruiting people to join police departments to join in other uh, first in other first responder positions and so you see a situation like this and and that certainly doesn't help with trying to recruit people into that type of role so knowing the numbers and seeing the data right now what is what are your thoughts on just how situations like this deadly encounters are impacting staffing so that's a very good question it's a very common question law enforcement staff shortages right now Lexi can have a significant they have significant implications for public safety and the well-being of all emergency responders, both the officers and communities. Uh, there's recruitment challenges. And the reason you're having these shortages and these challenges, first of all, is let's think about this for a minute. You know, you could have one or two bad apples within a department, and it has a ripple effect on all agencies. Officers have become very hesitant in many communities to make decisions um, and because they don't want to make the wrong decision. So there's that level of hesitation. If, you, if these officers have a level of hesitation based on the police misconduct and things that have happened in the past, well, then they're going to find themselves in grave danger when they have to make a decision, right? A critical decision that requires literally seconds to close a gap. So you have the mortality rate that is high as a result of that. That in itself could be a deterrent. You also have a job there, a position there with a law enforcement, as a law enforcement officer that really doesn't pay what the officer is actually worth. So I always say that funding is not a good idea. Uh, you want to properly train. You want to properly have those law enforcement officers that are able to sustain and actually protect their communities. So I would always say that uh, uh, a big reason is, is the fact of, of past history as to why that is a deterrent for officers, for, for individuals wanting to become police officers, and the mere fact that what is the pay structure? Those officers that are working today are not working because of, of the pay. They're working because it's in their soul. It's in their heart. This is what they want to do. Uh, they want to be able to, to deliver to their communities. And if you die in the line of duty, you die doing what you wanted to do at the end of the day. And you're okay with that, right? These officers are okay with that. So... Uh, again, there's many reasons for the staff shortage. Uh, the, big, the number one, I would say, is you obviously have to navigate around the negative public perception that uh, law enforcement communities have had in the recent past because of certain individuals that, uh, as a result of just bad bad conduct. So the, the increase in workload is another thing, Lexi. If you have a, a very uh, lean staff, if you have lean staff within your police departments, this increases their workload, and that in itself can challenge from a mental to a physical perspective any of the law enforcement officers that are working within those departments. So as supervisors, you got to be very mindful of that. Situation quickly escalated into gunfire with those first responders. We do have team coverage tonight of this tragedy. Bab Santos is at the scene in Burnsville with accounts from neighbors who heard this unfold. And our Courtney Godfrey is live outside Burnsville City Hall where a vigil is set to begin at 6.30. We begin, though, with Karen Scullin, who was at a news conference that wrapped up just a short time ago. And Karen, a difficult day for the city of Burnsville as they also work to investigate the origin of this domestic call. 
As you can imagine, right, as you said, just a very, very heavy day for the city of Burnsville and certainly Burnsville leaders and the police department and the fire department as well. Behind me here, you see the flag at half staff uh, outside City Hall, but then also firefighters have raised a flag outside City Hall behind me, obviously recognizing just how um, difficult this situation is for the community and for the city as well. Let's kind of run down what happened here at the scene today. It was just about 10 minutes to 2 in the morning that police got a call. A domestic situation was developing and they responded. Let's show some video from that scene now. And we had a helicopter video over the scene where a greenhouse, you see the greenhouse window shot out. Uh, that is the situation from the scene there. But police saying today, the BCA saying today, that when they responded, the suspect inside the home was firing from different points inside the house. Inside that home was a suspect, a mom and seven children ranging in ages from 2 to 15 years old. Now, none of them were hurt. That is some good news there. But who was hurt and killed were, as we've said, the two officers and the paramedic. I asked the question whether they were shot inside the home or outside the home. They said they are still investigating that because there were numerous, so many shots were fired and a neighbor telling me it sounded like rapid fire. I also asked, did he shoot out a second story window? Because that is what I was told. We, of course, have seen the SWAT vehicle with bullet holes in it. He said it does appear that he shot out that window, but again, unclear exactly where these people, where the two, the three people were shot and ultimately killed. Let's now hear from the police chief and the fire chief about how they're handling the situation. It's obviously very, very difficult. We're heartbroken. We are heartbroken. We are going to need time to be together, please. Our families need time to grieve. They need time to be together. We need you to pray for them. That's what we need right now. Our folks come to work every day and are willing to give up the ultimate sacrifice of their life, but no one expects it to happen. It's a tragic day. We're all grieving and we're all trying to understand what happened and why. I do need to mention just the amount of support that has come forward to support the community here. Not only the governor was here, Governor Walls was here just a few moments ago, but there are numerous police departments on hand here that are offering their support. Just a very, very difficult day for so many people. I'm going to toss it to my colleague now, Bab Santos, who's live at the scene where this all started unfolding very early this morning. Babs? Now, Karen, you know, we've been here since about 9 a.m., and really so much has happened in this neighborhood in that time. Uh, we saw a SWAT vehicle riddled with bullets across the windshield, actually had to be towed away. And later in the day, a man showed up identifying himself to me as a brother of one of the police officers that was killed. He was clearly distraught. Really, this entire neighborhood is so shaken up today. You know, if I had to guess, probably 20 to 30, um, you know, Gunshots. Families woke up to loud bangs and gunfire on Sunday morning. The terrifying sounds of a gun battle in their normally quiet Burnsville neighborhood. All after police say a man barricaded himself inside of a home with his family just before 2 a.m. Connor Noonan lives a block away from where it happened. We heard a lot of rapid fire. Um, a lot of gunshots. <laughs> Alex Martinez and Carmen Schaefer live across the street from Sunday's chaos and say they looked out the window to see police officers running in every direction to surround this house on 33rd Avenue South. I saw a body on the ground and they were screaming. Burnsville police later confirmed these two police officers and a firefighter paramedic were shot dead while the fourth officer had to be hospitalized but is expected to survive. It's just so heartbreaking. We really feel for them. Uh, if there's anything we can do as a Burnsville community, um, you know, they just need to say the word. The BCA has now taken the lead on this investigation, all while rattled neighbors do some investigating of their own. Their bedroom window was shot. We have a hole in the window and... Um, yeah, and in our siding. Authorities sent out a shelter in place notification as the bullets were flying. Later, by 8 a.m., law enforcement says the suspect was found dead, and his family members, seven children, according to neighbors, were able to safely leave the home. We saw, the, you know, the kids come out of the house. I was grateful, but I felt so 
awful for those kids and what they had to endure, you know, and, and the mom and just, just the terror that happened, you know, in that house for those kids. It'll never be the same. Tonight, the city of Burnsville will have a vigil for all who are mourning this loss today. That's happening at 6.30 at the Burnsville City Hall. And I know our reporter, Courtney Godfrey, will be there, so I want to pass the baton on to her now. Yeah, thanks so much, Babs. That's right. A vigil planned for tonight at 6.30 at Burnsville City Hall. You can see behind me the squad cars of those fallen officers. Already a, a growing memorial here. We've seen officers from uh, varying police departments dropping off flowers. We've even seen some snacks and drinks brought into the police department to support those officers in this time of need. And 6.30 tonight, the community and city leaders will come together just to remember those officers and that pair medic firefighter who took the ultimate sacrifice early this morning. I'm going to step aside so you can get a closer look at these squad cars uh, and the growing memorial that's taking place here. But in the coming days, this community and the entire state will come together to honor these fallen heroes with formal memorials and ceremonies. Usually the entity that handles those events is the Minnesota Law Enforcement Memorial Association. And I talked to the organization's president earlier who told me while they have yet to meet with the victims' families, they are ready to help, pointing out that it's not just the families themselves who are hurting from this loss, but that every man and woman in uniform is deeply impacted by these tragic deaths. I think one of the things that people forget on a day like today is that we still have 911 calls that are coming in. We still have communities that need help from our first responders. And so all over the city of Burnsville and throughout this state and this country, there are officers that know that this happened. They have this information in the back of their head, but still are in the uniform answering that call. Yeah, everyone in uniform across the state and country tonight impacted by this as you see this news spreading uh, across the nation. Again, there will be a vigil here tonight at 630 as the city manager said today during that press conference that we all need to support each other during this tragic time. Randy Kelsey. And we will stream that vigil live at 630 as well. So we will have a presence for that as well. And, and, and Brian made a good point there. And that is that we forget sometimes that even though this was going on since early, the early morning hours and all this law enforcement was focused on this, the procession of everything else, there are still right. people needing help in these communities that is separate from what has occurred here. Yeah, and, the, and then the outpouring of support for Burnsville itself as this department takes the necessary time that it needs to grieve mm -hmm. and handle the situation. You have officers from surrounding communities helping to answer their yeah. calls for All mutual right. aid. But we're going to keep this as, uh, you know, as, as above board as possible here throughout the next few hours, but we do need to check in with Ian Leonard uh, because, geez, it was just a, uh, another February day that you wouldn't expect. For yeah, you know, when you just juxtapose what what happened in Burnsville with a, with a glorious forecast today, brilliant sunshine, very on February like. Of interesting note here, you'll look outside and it's not overly warm. A high today of 36. Notice our average high though has bumped up all the way to 30. By the time we get into next week, our average high is above freezing. But what's important here is the sun angle. Not overly warm, but the melt was definitely a foot today with high temperatures temperatures in the upper 20s across the north, mid to upper 30s across the south. That sun angle is the same power as about mid-October. And if you think mid-October, think about how we can easily pop 50s and 60s. Now that I've let those two numbers out, I will tell you that this coming week will be very quiet and also rather warm, but a week further into the forecast. And I'll tell you, some of the charts are starting to point to the 50s and hold us there for some time. So uh, a big change of foot, even with that fresh base of snow still slowly melting away. And of course, we'll talk about the week ahead coming up in your forecast. OK, thank you, Ian. And we will have much more coverage as the details continue to come in from Burnsville tonight. Coming up, we're going to share what city leaders are saying following that shooting. Stay right here. Fox Local is how you stream Fox 9 on your TV for free.
And welcome back. Earlier today on the Fox 9 Morning News, Minneapolis Mayor Jacob Fry and Police Chief Brian O'Hara were in our studios. We had previously planned on having them as guests, but instead, obviously, talked to them about the tragedy in Burnsville. Here is some of that interview with Fox 9's Leah Bino. I was with the uh, Burnsville Police Chief this morning, um, as well as several members of our department. Um, and, uh, you know, our hearts go out to uh, Chief Tanya Schwartz uh, and the members of the Burnsville Police uh, and all the families who are affected by this tragedy. Um, it's just a reminder of uh, the nature of this job today, the nature of police work. It's a reminder that policing is truly a noble profession, um, that our members in departments everywhere have to be prepared on a moment's notice um, to put their life on the line. And I think um, we're reminded that uh, just with so much gun violence lately, we've seen Kansas City this week um, and so many other incidents. Um, you know, our, our officers, we ask a whole lot yes. of police officers in this country today. Um, we ask them to do a whole lot of different things. And um, you know, a, again, uh, I think this is just a reminder of how serious a commitment people make when they put on this uniform and they leave their loved ones every day. What does the city do? I mean, these are our neighbors. Mm -hmm. What do you do to try to help in mm -hmm. whatever way you can? There's a lot of solidarity right now, not just between police officers, but between cities. I reached out to Mayor Kautz just a little bit ago to make sure that she knew that the city of Minneapolis is 100% with Burnsville right now and we're with these police officers and their families. As the chief mentioned, this is not just a noble profession, it's an honorable one. They're running towards danger when so much of many of the rest of us would run in the opposite direction. Uh, it, it's a job that you step up to because you want to protect and serve your communities. Uh, and so often the circumstances that they find themselves in are like that of this morning. This is actually not unique, sadly, but truly. Uh, and we need to make sure that these police officers have our support, not just in Burnsville, but across our state. And of course we know, you know, the, the jurisdiction lines, the, they matter and they don't matter. What do you tell your own officers when, like you said, we've seen these dangers sure. in Minneapolis and other cities across the country. What do you tell your officers on a day like this when their friends and neighbors yeah. are going through this and their wives and husbands are potentially getting this knock on the door? Sure. Um, well, our officers know, uh, you know, obviously criminals don't honor, you know, municipal boundaries. Uh, and certainly that has never mattered in law enforcement either. Um, one thing I remember being told in the police academy before the September 11th attacks, you know, if one officer is enough, we'll send 10. If 10 aren't enough, 100 will show up and so on. Um, and that's what we saw this morning. Uh, Chief Roger New uh, was also there this morning, the chief from South St. Paul, uh, other police departments around the metro everyone uh, available to offer whatever support is needed both today and in the coming days uh, because we know that's absolutely essential and particularly with our own members it's important for our, myself and other chiefs to be present with our members to remind them uh, that we are here uh, we're here to support them and their families um, because this is something that's very difficult and I just I know every police officer out there is thinking as they hear of this uh, as they hear of stories from other officers that were there what they endured. I know they're thinking, my God, that had to be absolutely terrifying. I can't imagine what it would be like to go through that. And I know in the back of their mind, them, their, their wives, their children, their parents, they're thinking, what if that could have been my loved one? And that's a thought that they have to have every single time that they go into work. When you go into these circumstances knowingly, it takes a whole kind of bravery that few people have. And still, this is an important public service that we need, that we need people to step up to do. And so we're calling on all heroes here. We're saying if you want to make a difference in your community, if you want to make sure that people are protected and served during some of the most trying circumstances that they will ever have in their lives, a police officer is a good and honorable profession to get that done. Uh, and while the numbers uh, that we've seen, not just in Minnesota, but nationwide, are, are dwindling of those that are going into the ranks, it shows how much more important this job is right now. Poignant thoughts there from both Chief O'Hara and 
Mayor Jacob Fry as they relate to and talk about the incident in Burnsville where three first responders died this morning. You can watch that full interview at fox9.com. We will have much more on today's deadly shooting of the three first responders. That's coming up at 5.30 as well. And just uh, taking a, a stopping point here for a moment to check on weather. Uh, you know, we did have a huge event here this weekend with the Lopet World Cup cross-country mm. skiing event. And for weeks we talked about will there be enough oh, snow. Yeah. And they were able to pull it off. thousand spectators. Yeah. You know, and I, I think people are like, well, how many people are going to go watch Nordic skiing? Oh, people oh, fly in for in these the events. 20,000. Yeah. And, and I think we put on a pretty good show mm -hmm. when you think about where the rest of us were over the last couple of weeks thinking about, oh, maybe I should start raking my lawn. You know, we started to have those kind of feelings. Right. We'll get back there once we melt down the snow we picked up on Wednesday and melt it will. I mentioned this earlier that the sun angle is now reminiscent of sun angle at about the midpoint of October. You know how warm October can get. You know, um, about three weeks ago, we talked an awful lot about the quote unquote atmospheric river pointed right at California. And guess what is back? Notice this large spinning area of low pressure. Well, from San Francisco all the way to Los Angeles, all the green in the background, those are flood advisories and flood warnings. These are winter storm warnings. It is yet another massive shot of moisture. Now, you know, you talk about how that may or may not play a role in our forecast. The last one spilled over some energy and we did pick up the snow. At this particular point, you've got stacked areas of low pressure already taking up space all up and down the Rockies. For us today, look how clear it was. High pressure in place here in the northern plains, the upper Midwest. It was a gorgeous sun-filled day, but we'll start to see some of these clouds spill further to the east late tonight and on and off over the next couple of days. There is an outside chance of perhaps a sprinkle as we wake up Tuesday morning, but in terms of active weather this week, there's not a whole lot and there is a very quiet radar picture for this afternoon into this evening. High temperatures today. Now with a fresh snowpack, it's harder to warm up and I've used this before uh, a discussion of how we actually warm up the air. The sun's rays don't warm up the air as they pass through. They warm up the ground, which in turn resonates that heat and warms up the lowest levels of the atmosphere. But when you have snow on the ground, if you went for a walk today, I took Baxter, it, you're almost blinded by the light being reflected reflected off the snow so uh, that sunshine isn't getting into the ground and isn't warming us up. We still made it into the mid to upper 30s today. It was a comfortable if not sloppy underfoot day right now 37 in Brainerd 35 in St. Cloud and 34 in the city still not a cloud in the sky. It was a lovely sun filled Sunday 34 degrees right now with the breeze out of the west that breeze cutting that temperature with a wind chill right now a feels like temperature in the mid 20s. So it was a sun filled melting sun Sunday, warming up as we hit midweek and then an even bigger warm up next week. Now I hinted about that earlier. You take that October sun angle, bring it forward into this portion of February once we're finished with the snow and tap into a dominant west southwest wind. Next week I'd expect temperatures to sit and hold in the 50s. For this week, we got to get there. We ought to melt the snow. 20 degrees overnight tonight. Warm and breezy tomorrow as we work toward a high approaching 40 degrees with afternoon cloudy periods. By Tuesday into the day, Wednesday, plenty of sun and Wednesday we are melting galore. Thursday and Friday, high temperatures in the upper 30s to low 40s and you get a hint of the warm up as we head through the weekend and look towards Sunday. Next Monday, I think there's a chance of rain and then we're sitting in the 50s wow. for the entire well, Hard we to believe. Back to uh, weird winter. Uh, we didn't really leave weird winter. Yeah. We've we just had a it. little bit of this. Yeah. All right. Stay here um, because we're going to talk about you for a second. Oh. For the fourth straight weekend, we had one of your polar plunges. Take a look at this. <laughs> oh, it's More the run in of 16,000 people <laughs> uh, participating in the polar plunge for Special Olympics Minnesota. This footage from yesterday's plunge at Prior <laughs> Lake. Look at that there. guy. Yep, yeah. Ian uh, led the charge into the cold, cold, cold waters out there. Uh, so far this season, participants have helped to raise more than $3 million for Special Olympics. Minnesota uh, there's athletes. Adam Jerpy and his son Stephen, freezing for Stephen. They, they do such a great job. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll tell you, as we talk about law enforcement, there is no polar plunge mm -hmm. without the men and women of law enforcement Minnesota. They make the machine go yeah, 24 really hours a day and and it's uh, you know I get to spend time with some of my friends from uh, Scott County Sheriff and it's just it's just great so yeah. reminds us 
Days like today remind us how important those jobs are and often overlooked. Right. Yeah, very Taken much. Taken for granted. Yep. We'll be right back. And once again, a somber day as we continue to cover the news out of Burnsville. And it's somber across the metro after fir three first responders were shot and killed this morning. We're going to kind of encapsulate it really quickly here before we send you another break uh, as we cover this stuff. But there's so much uh, we're still learning about that shooting this morning. Our team of reporters are standing by with the latest details. Police did hold a press conference about 4 o'clock this afternoon. A vigil also scheduled for the victims and anyone who wants to, family members, anybody who might want to... Um, attend that. That's at the uh, Burnsville City Hall at 630. We'll continue to bring you more information coming up at 530. Stay right here with Fox 9.
We're continuing to follow the fatal shooting of three first responders in Burnsville this morning. It happened this morning around uh, 5.30 a.m. Those officers have been identified as Paul Elmstrand and Matthew Ruge, who are two Burnsville police officers. Adam Finseth who was a Burnsville firefighter and paramedic. Sergeant Adam Medlicott was also hurt with wounds that do not appear to be life-threatening. And unfolding just before 2 a.m., Burnsville police called to the 12,600 block of 33rd Avenue South on a report of a domestic situation where a man was reportedly armed. And after arriving, the situation quickly escalated into gunfire with those first responders. We have team coverage tonight of this tragedy. Bab Santos is near the scene in Burnsville with accounts from neighbors who heard this unfold. Courtney Godfrey live outside Burnsville City Hall where a vigil is set to begin at 5 at 630. And we begin though tonight with Karen Scullin who was at a news conference that wrapped up just a short time ago. And Karen, a difficult day for the city of Burnsville as they continue to investigate this. Absolutely. A very, very heavy day here at City Hall. City leaders holding back tears as they address the media, often referring to Burnsville employees as family. Family, that word was used quite a bit today. The BCA, who is investigating the situation, also updating us on what happened. Let's roll some of the video from the scene. And it's all started around 2 a.m. this morning. Police responded to a domestic call. Inside the home was a man, a woman, and seven children ages 2 to 15 years old. Those children and the woman inside were not hurt. At some point, shots were fired inside and outside the home. It's unclear how that exchange of gunfire actually unfolded. Again, though, BCA saying the suspect fired from multiple locations, both inside and outside the home, shooting outside is what I mean there. Now with that, they could not say where exactly the two officers and the paramedic were shot, were shot and killed. We do know the suspect fired out the window of the top floor of the split level. That's when that SWAT vehicle was hit. Six bullets fired into that windshield, but neighbors telling me they heard just a hail of gunfire. It sounded like a war zone, he said. We were told there was a lot of negotiation before this gunfire unfolded. They tried to negotiate with him for quite some time, but ultimately, as we know, two officers were killed along with a firefighter paramedic. We were also told the suspect was dead. Unclear, though, if it was a suicide or if he was, in fact, killed by police. Now, let's hear from the police and the fire chiefs on this very, very difficult day. We're heartbroken. We are heartbroken. We are going to need time to be together. Please, our families need time to grieve. They need time to be together. We need you to pray for them. That's what we need right now. Our folks come to work every day and are willing to give up the ultimate sacrifice of their life, but no one expects it to happen. It's a tragic day. We're all grieving and we're all trying to understand what happened and why. I can tell you Governor Walls was also here recognizing the gravity of the situation. There are numerous departments on hand here from all over the metro and I have also witnessed a number of community members walk up to police to tell them they are thinking and praying for them. One man outside City Hall earlier today was waving a blue line flag back here live. I can tell you this is just a very, very difficult day, not only for the city of Burnsville, for Dakota County and really the entire state. A lot of people recognizing that this is just a heartbreaking situation here. Let's go live now to my colleague Bab Santos, who is at the scene where this all unfolded in the overnight hours. Babs. Karen, it has been a traumatic day in this neighborhood. Earlier, we saw a SWAT vehicle just riddled with bullets across the entire front side. It had to be towed away. And then a few hours after that, a man who identified himself as the brother of one of the police officers killed showed up as family members got the news of what had happened today. Really, so many people in Burnsville today so shaken up by this news. You know, if I had to guess, probably 20 to 30 um, you know, gunshots. Families woke up to loud bangs and gunfire on Sunday morning. The terrifying sounds of a gun battle in their normally quiet Burnsville neighborhood. All after police say a man barricaded himself inside of a home with his family just before 2 a.m. Connor Noonan lives a block away from where it happened. We heard a lot of rapid fire. Um, 
A lot of gunshots. Alex Martinez and Carmen Schaefer live across the street from Sunday's chaos and say they looked out the window to see police officers running in every direction to surround this house on 33rd Avenue South. I saw a body on the ground and they were screaming. Burnsville police later confirmed these two police officers and a firefighter paramedic were shot dead, while the fourth officer had to be hospitalized but is expected to survive. It's just so heartbreaking. We really feel for them. Uh, if there's anything we can do as a Burnsville community, um, you know, they just need to say the word. The BCA has now taken the lead on this investigation, all while rattled neighbors do some investigating of their own. Their bedroom window was shot. We have a hole in the window and, um, yeah, and in our siding. Authorities sent out a shelter-in-place notification as the bullets were flying. Later, by 8 a.m., law enforcement says the suspect was found dead and his family members, seven children, according to neighbors, were able to safely leave the home. We saw, the, you know, the kids come out of the house. I was grateful, but I felt so awful for those kids and what they had to endure, you know, and, and the mom and just, just the terror that happened, you know, in that house for those kids. It'll never be the same. Tonight, in just under an hour, the city of Burnville will host a vigil for people to gather and mourn this loss today. That's happening at the Burnsville City Hall. Our reporter, Courtney Godfrey, will be there tonight, so I want to send it over to her now. Thanks, Babs. And as you heard, my colleague Karen Scullin mentioned the community really showing up for this city and for the police department here. We've seen a constant stream of neighbors and other police departments showing up to lay flowers on the squad cars. I'll step out so you can see, but Officer Elmstrand and Officer Rouge's squad cars are already parked here outside of the Vernsville Police Department as a growing memorial takes shape outside of the department here. And in the coming days, this community and the entire state will come to honor these fallen heroes with formal memorials and ceremonies. Usually those events uh, are backed by the Minnesota Law Enforcement Memorial Association. I talked to the organization's president earlier today who said they have yet to meet with the victims' families. They probably will in the coming days, but they are ready to help, pointing out that this is not just the families themselves who are hurting from this loss, but that every man and woman in uniform is deeply impacted by these tragic deaths. Those people made a sacrifice that was bigger than themselves today, and the rest of us will continue to put this uniform on, whichever uniform it is, um, because we believe in what it is that we're supposed to be doing. Yeah, we heard the city manager today say it's important that we take care of each other today, just echoing the sentiment that the city is in mourning, that the city is grieving, but it's not just the city. As you heard Governor Walls say during that press conference earlier today, it's the entire state. Again, a vigil will be taking place here tonight at 6.30 as we watch this memorial grow, and we will bring you that vigil live here on Fox 9. Kelsey Randy. Mm -hmm. Can't state enough, and it's really hard to put into words how the magnitude of how heavy this is and how daunting this is for family and friends and everyone else involved. And in his closing remarks today, the governor also said, as you see those flags flying at yeah. half staff, remember the courage it takes to sign up for a job like this. All right, still ahead tonight, Russia now has seized full control of a Ukrainian city. And what the crucial win for Russia would mean and why lawmakers believe now is the time to send more aid to Ukraine. And we'll continue to bring you more on the latest in Burnsville as we receive new information tonight. We'll be right back. Fox Local is how you stream Fox 9 on your TV for free.
As fighting continues in Gaza, the top UN court has rejected South Africa's request to safeguard the southern city of Rafa. This as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has announced plans to move troops toward the city. World leaders fear the fighting in southern Gaza and northern Israel could expand into another full-blown war. Fox's Mike Tobin has more on Israel's growing offensive. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu told the Israeli press tonight that the offensive in Rafah on the southern end of the Gaza Strip is coming. He also said the creation of a Palestinian state now would be a gift in response to the October 7th massacre. This as the tension on the border with Lebanon reaches its highest level since the October attack. On Wednesday, eight people were injured, one killed by rocket fire in Israel's north. The IDF responded with airstrikes, some deep into Lebanon. At least three Hezbollah fighters, one a commander, were killed. As soon as the Hezbollah funerals were over, rockets returned to the north of Israel. The north is largely a ghost town. Ninety percent of the people have left shortly after the October 7th attack ignited new rocket fire. Most of the shops are closed and the people have been gone for four months. As the world watches nervously, fearing the Lebanese border will slip into another war, Israelis living in the north hope it will. They feel the resolution that ended the last war was not respected, so Hezbollah is an armed force on their border as great a threat as Hamas in the south. But this is not life. And uh, what the government needs to do is to tell to IDF to go and take care of Hezbollah. We now have very little faith in, in another diplomatic solution. Uh, it's totally failure. As it relates to the South, Israeli Defense Minister Yoav Gallant told reporters IDF commanders are planning an offensive into Rafah on the border with Egypt, which Prime Minister Netanyahu called the last bastion of Hamas. While Egypt installs concrete walls for a compound to handle the Palestinians who flee the fighting in Gaza, Gallant promises there is no plan to drive Palestinian refugees into Egypt. In Tel Aviv, Mike Tobin, Fox News. Also making headlines tonight, police investigating the deaths of two people at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs as a homicide. The bodies were found inside a dorm room early Friday morning following the report of a shooting. Investigators have not released any details, but say it does not appear to be a murder-suicide. The campus was put on lockdown for 90 minutes. That lockdown was later isolated to just the student apartment complex. Classes canceled for tomorrow. Donald Trump telling a crowd in Michigan he plans to appeal the decision in his New York civil fraud case. The former president railed against the judge who ordered Trump to pay more than $350 million in damages. Crooked judge, crooked judge. He's a crooked judge. The case is a complete and total sham. It's a sham case. He is also temporarily barred from doing business in New York because of deceptive business practices. Early voting is underway in South Carolina's GOP primary. Former President Donald Trump still holds a large lead over Nikki Haley in their home state, in her home state. But the former U.N. ambassador is not backing down today. Haley has criticized Trump's foreign policy and mental fitness, saying he isn't capable of handling overseas issues. The state is also allowing Democrats to participate in this week's primary as long as they did not vote in the Democratic primary earlier this month. Russia says it is in full control of the Ukrainian city of Avdivka. It comes after Ukrainian forces withdrew following a lack of ammunition and supplies. Taking the city has been Russia's biggest gain in the war in nearly a year. And it's a situation some lawmakers believe call for another U.S. aid package to Ukraine. Fox's Lucas Tomlinson has the latest on Russia's advancement. The Kremlin says it's in full control of the town of Avdivka in eastern Ukraine. Outnumbered Ukrainian troops forced to withdraw after months of fierce fighting. It's Russia's biggest victory in nine months and a major setback for Ukraine, one that some lawmakers say signals the urgency of another aid package for the embattled country. They've just had their lost the first defeat, the Ukrainians, since last May, uh, uh, partly as a result of the fact that they're outgunned 10 to 1 by the Russians. We can help solve that problem for them, and we should. A bill that would provide another $60 billion in funding for Ukraine is currently in limbo. A bipartisan alternative has been introduced, which includes funding for the southern border. Those in favor of sending aid say the impact of deterring Russian aggression goes beyond Ukraine's borders. 
is who stops Vladimir Putin if he marches right into Kyiv, yeah. marches right into Ukraine yeah. from going further. And this is an international crisis. The bulk of the assistance are weapons to be used in the battlefield. Republican Senator J.D. Vance is one of the most vocal opponents of sending more aid to Ukraine, arguing that with no end to the war in sight, the U.S. is it's not making enough there, munitions yeah. to support the cause mm -hmm. indefinitely. Can we send the level of weaponry we've set for the last 18 months, for the next 18 months, we simply cannot. The ability of Congress to deliver more weapons to Ukraine will have a lasting impact on the battlefield after Ukraine's counteroffensive failed. Traveling with the president in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware, Lucas Tomlinson, Fox 9. All right, well, despite everything that happened today, we still need to discuss the weather, which... Mm -hmm. uh, as things go, was a nice bright sunny yeah. day. Mm -hmm. At times, though, the temperatures were back to winter this this week, and that wind yesterday was hmm. biting. Remember, I said winter was over, but we'd still get a blast. Well, that was a blast. Yeah, it was, and not in a good way. Mm -hmm. During the pool, uh, polar plunge yesterday in Prior Lake, it, uh, the wind chill was four. Yeah. I mean, once you were away from the lake, it really wasn't bad. I think if you were out of the wind yesterday, it was still cold, but man, that wind was nasty. Yeah, it was whipping. So, we did have winter weather, though, for the World Cup. Yeah, finally, All, right? For six weeks, we've been wondering, are they going to be able to have this cross-country yeah. ski event? And they were able did to it, have it. I've seen reports, you know, 20,000 spectators, and they really dressed the place up wonderful. Well, uh, have we heard, like, was it, was, can we call it a smashing success? Well, so far, I mean, aesthetically, there was aesthetically pleasing because of that layer of snow mm -hmm. we got. Mm -hmm. And, yes, the, it, it seemed to be really well attended. Uh, Jesse right. Diggins did quite well, made the podium uh, today, I believe, uh, taking a third place today and a hmm. fourth place. I think the fact that they had to make so much snow for weeks and yeah. weeks and carefully take care of uh, Theodore Worth, I think it ha you have to call it a success because sure. they, they did it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, no, it's, it's cool. Now, and now we can just let all the snow go. <sighs> No need to hold on to it. Here's Storm Vision. Uh, you might notice, you probably did, that I'm starting out on the west coast. Yet another atmospheric river. And you'll see the color green in the background here. You'll see this long color of purple. The green are flood advisories and flood warnings. The purple are winter storm warnings. So big time rain, big time snow, all a part of the forecast from San Francisco all the way south to Los Angeles and San Diego. Sunny Southern California is going to get yet another soaker. That's just is going to have a hard time advancing any further off the coast as stacked areas of low pressure run up and down the Rockies. Now, at some point, these will move, but it takes yet another movement. This area of high pressure. Look, there's no clouds here. So clear, but as this high slowly pulls away, we'll open the door for clouds to advance over the northern plains. So we'll talk about cloudy periods. Tomorrow, we'll talk about cloudy periods into the day on Tuesday. But otherwise, you know, maybe, maybe a sprinkle Tuesday morning, but that is it in terms of any active weather coming this week. It is a very quiet quiet forecast this evening on radar after a gorgeous sun-filled day. 36 in the cities, 37 in Hinkley, St. Cloud, and Brainerd. So temperatures were up, but not as warm as we've had over the last month. Would you believe, though, you start looking forward to the end of February and doing some raw calculations? I think we are solidly on track to be the warmest December, January, and February winter meteorological winter period since 1877 to 1878. I mean, it has been such a bizarre winter. And wait till you see the forecast for next week. 34 degrees right now. The sun set about 15 minutes ago. A live look outside after a sun-filled, melting Sunday. We warm up as we hit midweek and melt things down. And we talk about an even bigger warm-up as we head toward next week. So let's string this together in your seven-day forecast. 39 tomorrow, partly cloudy for President's Day, Tuesday and Wednesday, high temperatures in the low 40s. The kicker here is a brilliant sun-filled sky. That sun as powerful right now as it is in mid-October. In mid-October, you guys know, I mean, you'll see uh, convertibles out there. Randy likes to get out in his convertible. Until? Until uh, Kelsey forced you to sell it. That's right. <laughs> Um, but it was a what? great, it was a great car. It was a great car. I'm talking to the wrong person. It was yeah. a great car. Well, I have that for about a week. About a week, yeah. yeah. It's fine. I just found it hard to believe that it was Randy's, and then it's a whole he thing. got self-conscious. Yeah. Well, look, uh, this week, not necessarily convertible weather. Next week, 
We'll talk about high temperatures sitting in the 50s and just sort I of stay there. Still can't believe it. All right. Thanks, Ian. Stay right here. We'll be back with more. And welcome back as we continue to follow all of the, the developments out of Burnsville this evening. And if you're just joining us, three first responders were shot and killed early this morning. Police are still investigating the situation. We will continue to bring you the latest information as we get it as well. But here's what we do know if you are just sort of tuning in either online on Fox Local or to us right now. It is simply put a terrible Minnesota tragedy that occurred this morning when those three first responders, two police officers from Burnsville and a fireman paramedic also from Burnsville were shot and killed on site of a domestic call that first came in around 1.50 this morning. And they tried to negotiate with this barricaded gunman who had uh, uh, seven children inside this home. And that negotiation went on for some time before uh, shots were fired early this morning. A procession 
from the hospital. There's the scene of where this took place. But from Note that upstairs window right there. Uh, yeah, completely shot out. I think both of them are really. Mm -hmm. HCMC um, is where they took the bodies uh, and then put American flags over each one of them. And then there was a procession that included hundreds of law enforcement vehicles that escorted those bodies to the medical examiner's office. That sums up the danger, that SWAT vehicle just riddled with bullets. There's a vigil at uh, the Burnsville City Hall that will happen. We will stream that on Fox Local. Mm -hmm. For now, though, that will do it for this coverage. We will continue throughout the evening. Okay. Have a good night. where people, where commanders give orders to companies or to, uh, uh, to organize uh, fighting formations. And you can say, you can have 100 people attack the Israeli army from this direction, or 50 people attack them from that direction. Once you destroy the battalions, there is no organized command and control structure. ...up with ground action, which is much less intense. We cannot leave a quarter of Hamas's terrorist battalions intact. No one would do that in the case of fighting ISIS. You wouldn't leave a quarter of ISIS intact in a defined territory. You wouldn't even think about that, and you didn't. America finished the job with its allies. We will finish the job here with our brave soldiers. And we will make sure that the civilian population has a way to get out of harm's way, to safe corridors, and to safe zones. I hope we can also reach an understanding on the day after Hamas. But here's the critical thing. The day after Hamas is the day after Hamas is destroyed. The emphasis is on after, after Hamas is removed from the scene. And I can tell you one thing that I think we can agree on many things. But one thing Israel cannot agree to is an international diktat that would seek to unilaterally 
uh, recognize a Palestinian state, basically force a Palestinian state on Israel after the horror of October 7th. And you should know that the people of Israel are really united in this. I brought today uh, a resolution before the government. I want to read it to you. Israel utterly rejects international diktats regarding a permanent settle settlement with the Palestinians. A settlement, if it is to be reached, will come about solely through direct negotiations between the parties without preconditions. Israel will continue to oppose unilateral recognition of a Palestinian state. Such a recognition in the wake of the October 7th massacre would be a massive and unprecedented reward to terrorism and would prevent any future peace agreement. This passed unanimously in the government today. It will pass tomorrow in the Knesset, I think with an overwhelming majority. And I hope that the conference can consider adopting this statement as well. This will send a message of unity, unity inside Israel, unity outside Israel, unity between us. And I have to tell you again, you can see this when you go outside. You can see that in the taxi cabs. You can see it if you walk into a restaurant or in the lobby of a hotel where you're staying at. Israel is united as never before. The army is united as never before. The public is united as never before. And we are united, and we are united with you for one thing, total victory. Total victory will give us security. Total victory will give us peace and an expansion of the peace with our Arab neighbors. And total victory will ensure our future. Thank you, friends. Thank you, the Conference of Presidents. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister, for joining us tonight at this beautiful Museum of Tolerance, Jerusalem. In overwhelming numbers, the American people stand with Israel. American Jews stand with Israel. Nearly 300,000 people, near, both Jews and non-Jews alike, marched on the National Mall in Washington to demonstrate that to the world. We have many true friends who are standing by our side. And those true friends are standing with us as we witness attempts to delegitimize Israel and the concomitant wave of global anti-Semitism, the glasslight and denialism, which started even before the blood had dried on October 7th. Mr. Prime Minister, American Jewry stands together, shoulder to shoulder with the brave soldiers of the IDF, who risk their lives every minute of every day to make the Jewish state safe. We stand shoulder to shoulder with the people of Israel as we demand the release of our hostages. In my lifetime, and I was born in 1968, so I can't speak to 1967, but for the last 55 years, the Jewish people have never been more united, more together, and more resolute. The motto of the Conference of Presidents is strength through unity, and the solidarity of global Jewry coming together in the face of one of our greatest threats in our long history as a people is the source of our tremendous strength. We are stronger as a people when we are unified. That unity has allowed us to survive and thrive for 3,500 years. Until the hostages are freed, until every soldier comes home safely, and until total victory is achieved, Mr. Prime Minister, we present you with this plaque made by the noted Jerusalem artist Sharon Binder. It reads from the Tehillim, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. We know how vigilantly you watch over all of Israel, and we give you strength, even as we draw strength from you. Am Yisrael Hai. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I try to get six hours of sleep every night, but I appreciate this very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's do a photo over this way. All right, you're just listening there to the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, talking about this to a conference of Jewish leaders. I'm Andy Mack, just past 7 o'clock on the East Coast. We do see a couple live shots pop up, including a vigil held in Minnesota. Of course, a very somber day there as they continue to remember the uh, life of those uh, three first responders that were killed in this uh, response to a domestic incident south of the Twin Cities. We did see flowers, we saw some balloons. You can see the flags at half staff there at the city hall there, uh, south of the Twin Cities, south of Minnesota, Minneapolis and St. Paul. 
a few people, but it's bundled up as it's cold. It is February in Minnesota, remembering those lives that were lost early this morning. I'm Andy Mack. We're back after this. All right, welcome back into live now from Fox. And this is a live picture in Burnsville, Minnesota, south of the Twin Cities. You can see some Burnsville sweatshirts there as they remember the, the lives of those three individuals that tragically were killed uh, in the line of duty earlier on today. I want to put up this tweet just to show the identities of these three individuals. Of course, they are Matthew Ruge, Adam Finseth, and Paul Elmstrand. Of course, they were there on hand at this uh, incident that took place, a domestic call uh, of a suspect barricaded inside a home with his wife and numerous other children. Fortunately, the children and the mom are safe, uh, but the uh, officers or police also shot and killed the suspect there. But, uh, of course, these three individuals losing their lives tragically on this day, on this Sunday, this cold Sunday in Minnesota. All right, let's take you back out to police and officials, a very emotional press conference from earlier. Let's listen into what they had to say as they were providing an update here on Live Now from Fox. Limburg. I'm the city manager here in Burnsville, and um, it's been a difficult and emotional day uh, here for our community and our team. I thank you all for being with us today uh, as we share some important information on a critical incident that occurred in our community this morning. Today, uh, we'll have several updates for you. Uh, first, Drew Evans from the BCA will provide an update on the critical incident that occurred. Uh, and then both our police chief and our fire chief um, will make comments uh, about this difficult day in our team, in our family here in Burnsville. Um, words can't express how hard today has been. Um, we know that people want and need information, and that's our role in providing good government and good service uh, to the community. And we want to also make sure that we take good care of our team, the people who serve this community day in and day out, and their families. So thank you for giving us the grace and the patience and the understanding to inform their loved ones, to take care of our team, um, and to even process this ourselves. With that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Mr. Evans with the BCA. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent at the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension, and we've been asked to investigate this matter, and I'll provide a quick update. Uh, first, um, you know, thank you on behalf of uh, the team here for all the law enforcement support, um, the governor's support, the commissioner of public safety support, uh, for everybody that's having just an incredibly difficult day. This is really a terrible day for the city of Burnsville, all of the residents, the law enforcement and fire communities that are mourning the loss of these uh, public servants that occurred early today. At approximately 1.50 a.m. on February 18th, uh, Burnsville police were called to a residence in the 12,600 block of 33rd Avenue South on a report of a domestic situation where a man was reported to be armed and barricaded with family members in the home. We later learned uh, that there were seven young children in the home, uh, ranging from ages two to 15 at the time of this event occurred. When officers got to the scene, the individual was barricaded and they spent quite a bit of time uh, negotiating with this individual who was barricaded in the home and additional officers responded um, at that time. At one point during that barricaded situation, uh, the uh, subject, uh, open fire on the officers in the home and officers Elmstrad, Rugi and Finseth for the fire department, uh, Mr. Finseth, were killed by the gunman during the response. One other officer, Sergeant Adam Medlicott, was injured and was shot uh, as well where he's suffered non-life-threatening injuries um, but has been treated, is in the process of being treated. At approximately 8 a.m., the subject was reported to be deceased in the home, and later that morning, those other children and family members were able to escape from the home. Residents were, are asked to allow our teams uh, to uh, stay away from the area and allow our teams uh, to complete the crime scene investigation that needs to occur in that location still at this time. Uh, I'm gonna go through quickly just a little bit of background on the officers before I uh, turn it over to Police Chief Schwartz that, and, and, and about who they are. Uh, Paul Elmstrand is 27 and joined the Burnsville Police Department in August of 2017, first as a community service officer, and he was later promoted to officer in July of 2019. He was part of the department's mobile command staff, peer team, honor guard, and field training unit. Officer Matthew Ruge, age 27, joined the Burnsville Police Department in April of 2020. He was part of the department's crisis negotiations team was a, uh, and was a physical evidence officer. And then firefighter Adam Finseth, uh, age 40, has been a Burnsville firefighter paramedic since 2019. As they noted, we're in the very beginning stages of this investigation. I know everybody wants to know exactly what occurred and, and really what led up to these really terrible event that occurred today. I'd ask that you have patience as we work through that. We'll piece together everything that we can to provide the answers in due time. Or at this time, we're providing these basic updates so that we can uh, share just a little bit of what occurred. We'll answer a few questions at the conclusion of this, uh, but we're, our crime scene will be active and ongoing uh, in that process. I will note just a few things uh, in this uh, in terms of the questions. We still don't know the uh, exact exchange of gunfire uh, that occurred. Uh, certainly uh, several officers uh, did uh, return fire. I will note that this individual had uh, several guns and large amounts of ammunition and shot at the police officers from multiple positions within the home uh, in that incident. And the exact timing and cadence of what occurred will be part of our active investigation as we review video, officers, uh, body cams, uh, video that might be in the area, conduct interviews and all available evidence to really figure out exactly what occurred in this incident. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Police Chief uh, Tanya Schwartz. Thank, thank you for being here. Uh, this is a hard day. It's a really hard day for our public safety family. We're hurting. Okay, we're hurting. Today, three members of our team made the ultimate sacrifice for this community. They are heroes. Our police officers and our fire paramedics, they come to work every day 
they do it willingly. They know that they might have to give up their life for their partners, for someone else. They know they have to give up their life sometime and they do it anyways. And you cannot understand it if you're not in the profession. Every day we want them to go home to their families. Every day we pray that they go home to their families. And today that's not happening. We are all hurting. Our officers, our fire department, our families, all of our staff, our community. We're heartbroken. We are heartbroken. We are going to need time to be together. Please. Our families need time to grieve. They need time to be together. We need you to pray for them. That's what we need right now. Superintendent Evan shared a little bit about each of the officers. I will just share that Officer Paul Elmstrand was with the department for six years and six months. Officer Matthew Ruge with the police department for three years and 10 months. Sergeant Adam Medlicott, who's expected to survive with the department for nine years and five months. We talk about it often here in Burnsville. We're a family. We take care of each other. And days like today is so important. So I'm going to turn it over to my brother, the fire department, Chief Jungman, and he is going to speak about the fire department family. Good afternoon. I am BJ Jungman. I'm the fire chief for the city of Burnsville. This is the toughest day that the city of Burnsville and our public safety family has ever experienced. My hearts and prayers go out to the families who lost a loved one in the line of duty today. Our folks come to work every day and are willing to give up the ultimate sacrifice of their life, but no one expects it to happen. It's a tragic day. We're all grieving and we're all trying to understand what happened and why. I would like to share a little bit of information about firefighter paramedic, the firefighter paramedic we lost in the line of duty today. Firefighter paramedic Adam Finseth, badge 83, was one of our SWAT paramedics um, and has been in the fire department for five years. He also served the city of Savage and the city of Hastings prior to coming to work at the city of Burnsville. No matter how much we try to understand that, there are no words to describe these public safety, to these public safety officer families, what they're going through right now. Our Burnsville community, including our city staff and police and fire families are grieving. We ask the media to respect the families and their privacy as they are processing this information. We thank our mutual aid partners who responded to the incidents and are helping us during this difficult time. We've had an outpouring of support through our community, which we greatly appreciate. And at this time, we'd ask our community to support each other and help each other grieve. We'd ask them to respect the families that lost someone today. We ask everybody to show grace and understanding for our community members and our city staff who are impacted by this. We're going to provide more information moving forward um, and how you can support these families financially in the coming days. I would ask you to go to burnsvillemn.gov slash community updates and we will keep you informed there. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to our city manager to close, uh, Greg Lindbergh. Chiefs, thank you. Um, Chief Swartz, Schwartz said it best uh, just now. We're hurting as a team and as a family, uh, particularly for those individuals who have chosen our police and our fire departments as a career to serve this community and to, to live out day to day 
what is one of the most important things here in Burnsville, and that's keeping our community safe. Um, we're going to support each other. Uh, we're going to care for one another as a team because we talk a lot about in this organization and as a family that if we take care of each other, that's when we can best care for our community. And we're going to do that, and it's going to be hard. We'll support our staff the best that we can in the coming days. We also will make sure that you have all of the information that you need to help us do the same. I'd ask uh, that you use uh, the website burnsvillemn.gov slash community updates, where we'll be posting all of the information uh, that we share with the community and beyond as we work together to continue to support each other, to care for the community. And speaking of caring for the community, I, I'd invite all of you, our community and beyond, uh, to attend an informal vigil tonight outside of City Hall, where we'll join together and start the process of grieving uh, and caring for each other in our support to strengthen our community and to make sure uh, that our team, our staff, the people who call Burnsville home and beyond know that together um, we will create uh, a safe community and one where we can all work together in caring for each other. And finally, um, the chiefs and I are, are going to return to the business of taking care of our family and taking care of our community. We really thank you for the time that you spent here today and, and appreciate uh, your, your willingness uh, to, to join us. So thank you very much. We can do just a couple questions. It's early in the investigation as a few, but we'll try to answer if we keep them to the investigation as we let them go back and continue. Yes, um, just for County, first of all, um, all three that were killed were killed inside the home? No, it's a good question. We're still piecing that together right now. Um, I can tell you at least one of the officers was shot inside of the home. The other two uh, that were deceased were still uh, piecing together if it was inside or outside of the home. But I can tell you that officer uh, that took fire inside of the home and once they were outside of the home. Was the paramedic uh, attending to an officer when he was struck? So the paramedic was piece of part of the team. The SWAT team was called to this incident and they were in the process of helping resolve that. And as part of that, they have paramedics that are assigned to that team and they were assisting uh, with uh, the, the officer, uh, the first one that was injured. Thanks for your update. Adrian Bronis from NBC News, eight-year Minnesota resident. Have you all been called to that home before? So we're still working through all of that. Uh, the home, um, there was at this particular residence with this individual, there had not been many calls for service at all. Situation that brought officers there. Can you elaborate on that? At, all? Uh, at this time, it's part of the active investigation. We can't provide any more information than what we've had. So the suspect is deceased, as we noted in this particular instance, and he is, um, uh, as a part of that, the medical examiner will do the official identification. We believe we know who the individual is, but the official identification needs to come from the medical office, medical examiner's office. We're working through that right now. The medical examiner will provide that. That autopsy will occur tomorrow. There was an armored vehicle on scene at that level. Are you able to say that protect other officers inside? So uh, that a vehicle that you saw was used as part of the SWAT team that was on scene um, as the or shortly after the gunfire erupted and was used as part of that process, which is why it was shot. There was a request for extreme risk protection orders against the suspect. Uh, we're still part of the active investigation at this time. Yeah. Well, certainly, you know, seven children inside of the home uh, from, you know, ages 15 to two, it's a very uh, troubling situation for everybody involved in this particular incident. And, and we're uh, glad they aren't uh, hurt as part of this. Who was able to call for help? So a, a resident that was inside of the residence made the initial call. Can you tell us about the gun? 
So we'll still, we'll be able to provide more information about that later on. I will say there were multiple firearms recovered from inside of the residence. Superintendent, you said you were going to... All right, you're just listening in there to officials provide an update from earlier on as you see the vigil continuing on. Let's just listen into this vigil there in Burnsville, Minnesota, as they remember the lives, these three individuals that lost their lives early this morning in Minnesota. You can hear there, they were singing a little bit. They were praying for those three individuals that lost their lives. There's plenty of flowers, different candles uh, lit up, plenty of officers on hand outside of City Hall in Burnsville, uh, Minnesota, for this uh, vigil taking place tonight, uh, 12 or so hours after the incident earlier today. Of course, we were following it very, very closely, courtesy of our Fox 9 team. Uh, I think they might be continuing to do this. Let's just continue to listen into the somber moment there in Burnsville. continue to watch this scene there. Let's take you back out because uh, we also want to take you out to the governor, Tim Wallace, as he was making some remarks earlier today about this incident. Uh, let's listen into what he had to say as well earlier on live now. Heartbroken. It, this is a tragedy that I, I think all of you are going through the same thing is really difficult to process. To the families uh, of Adam, Paul, and Matt, Minnesota mourns with you. Uh, state stands ready to assist in any way possible. You've seen from BCA, Commissioner Jacobson, the State Patrol, of course, assisting in ways that they can. But that's just not today and tomorrow. It's for years to come. And I think for Minnesotans to recognize. City of Burnsville in mourning tonight. Two officers and a firefighter killed in the line of duty earlier this morning. Authorities identifying the slain officers as Paul Elmstrand and Matthew Ruge. Adam Finseth was a firefighter and paramedic on the scene. Authorities are still trying to piece together all the details, and there are many. Uh, here's what we do know so far tonight. This started in the early morning hours with a domestic call. An armed man barricaded with his family inside his home. There was an exchange of gunfire, and the two officers and a firefighter were killed. A third officer injured with what are believed to be non-life-threatening injuries. Officials say the suspect is dead. Details about he, how he may have died have not been released yet, though. That is the home where all of this played out early this morning. Uh, city official, uh, law enforcement, other first responders today laying out a process that is deep in grieving, deep in healing, and that process is starting tonight already. Community f coming together for a candlelight vigil outside the Burnsville City Hall. Let's take a li listen to this, and we'll just stream this live for you. Uh, just so you can be a part of it if you can't make it to Burnsville, uh, and we'll just uh, watch it throughout the evening.
everyone. Uh, we don't have a formal program planned for this evening, but I do want to make a couple of comments uh, to, to welcome you and to honor the lives of the team members that we lost today in both the Burnsville Police Department and Fire Department uh, and come together as a community uh, to take the opportunity to grieve together uh, and to and those who risk their lives every day uh, in the interest of all of our safety. My name is Greg Lindbergh. I'm the city manager here in Burnsville. I have the distinct privilege. Uh, I'm sorry, it's been a it's been an emotional day. It's, it's been a hard day. But I have the distinct privilege of working alongside the men and women of our police department and our fire department who choose to come to work every day and risk their lives to the benefit of all of us and our safety. And today's been a tragic day in our community as we've lost two of our police officers and one of our firefighter paramedics in a tragic and critical incident earlier this morning. I want to thank you for the grace and the patience that you've given us today and ask for your grace and patience as we work through the next several days and beyond in making sure you have the information that you need, but also making sure that we're taking good care of our colleagues, our friends that we lost today and making sure that we care well for them, their memory, and their families as, as the time passes on. Um, as you can see around us, we have a lot of friends and neighbors who come together. And I, I thank you for your support it means more to me than I can find the words to express. And I know it means the same to our team. Just a few of, of them are behind me. Certainly our city council members, other elected officials throughout the community. We're gonna need your help. We're gonna need your support uh, over, the course of, uh, over the course of time. I wanna point you uh, again, just as a reminder, uh, we're gonna keep you updated. Uh, the best that we possibly can. There's a website available, burnsvillemn.gov slash community updates, where we'll make sure all of the information on how you can support the families uh, of our fallen officers and our team and find the information that you need about what's happened today and what happens in the days and weeks to come. With that, thank you again for the patience the grace and the kindness that you're showing in supporting us, caring for our team, so we can take care of all of you together. And with that, one of our chaplains, Father Jim, uh, has a few words for us. Sure. As I look at all of us gathered here, there's one thing. That is full of love. If you got a cap, if you just take it off, and let's honor the memory of those whom we love. At times like this, we oftentimes do not have words, but we have the love that is in our hearts. And let us remember the words um, that can serve at this time. Let's pray together. Our Father, who art Lord in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will, will be done, on earth, earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, bread and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against, against us. us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Deliver us, Lord, from every evil. Grant us peace in our day. In your great mercy, keep us free from sin, safe from all distress, as we await now the blessed hope.
coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, power, glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for being here this evening and supporting us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Does anyone want to come forward and say anything while we're sharing together? I like to share. We're in season of Lent, and there's a Tze chant. And after I sing it a couple of times, I invite you to join me. We go from Calvary to Easter mornings. May you have your family walk into Stark Valley find hope in the midst of the tragedy. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus. God is our refuge and a very present help in times of trouble. That is why we are not afraid. Our trust is in the name of the Lord. And even as God's word reminds us in the book of Romans, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so we come together as a city and we ask you, Heavenly Father, hear our prayer 
and comfort our hearts. Heal the brokenness. Bind up the wounds. Minister peace to those of us who are heavily stricken with grief tonight. And we pray that even through this, something good will come out. For what the enemy meant for evil, you always take it and turn it around and make it work for our good. We speak peace to our community and blessings to our officers in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you so much for being here. Um, we're all grieving, and, and we're going to do it together. Um, Burnsville's a special place. It's why many of us choose to, uh, to come to work today every day, to, to serve the community, particularly for our police and fire department. I, I do want to give you all a reminder, and the city will be releasing more information on this again uh, through a press release and at burnsvillemn.gov slash community updates. There's been an outpouring of support and questions about how, how you can all help the families uh, of those that we've lost today. Uh, we're working on putting together and, and working with those families to make sure that we can direct that kindness and that care appropriately. So that information will be available at burnsvillemn.gov slash community updates. And we'll also get that information out through our other typical channels to make sure uh, that for those of you who are looking uh, to support those families uh, in that way, that you, you have the opportunity to do so. So look for more um, on that shortly from us. I just wanted to say uh, that I implore you 
um, whether you're um, an EMT, a paramedic, um, a, uh, a nurse, a doctor, or a uh, police officer, a firefighter, uh, or a citizen, I implore you to remember the effect that this has not only on the families, but the officers that serve beside them, and the pain that comes with that, and the grief that comes alongside that. Um, I just implore you to try to give grace to the professionals that you see around you. Um, because this sort of impact, it's like losing a brother or a sister. So please take care. Thank you. first responders, the Burnsville police officers. I was with Mark. He's here today. I can't imagine the pain that you're all going through. I just can't imagine. But what I want to say is to all of our officers out there, the paramedics, our fire department, thank you for what you do for our community. Thank you. That's it, as a community, to come together and grieve our community's loss. That's what we have to do. And to support the families that are affected yes. most directly by this terrible, devastating tragedy today. So thank you to our chaplains who I know have been with the families, including the family here in Burnsville of police officers and fire department members here today. So I just want to say thank you. It's truly an honor to be part of such a beautiful community gathering tonight. Thank you. Thank you. want to say thank you all for again for coming tonight. Um, it shows that uh, we're beginning to heal even now in this time of struggle. And I just want to offer petitions to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one who can heal all things. We know that our community is broken right now and our hearts are heavy. Um, there are little children here who, who are going to be missing their daddy. And as a dad, that breaks my heart. So just pray with me. Heavenly Father, come ask for healing. You told us where one or two or more are gathered in my name that your will will be done. So we ask for this community. We ask for healing for these families, for their children. We ask God for healing for ourselves. We're all hurting today. We need you more than ever. We know that we're not alone because we have you with us. So strengthen us in the days and weeks and months ahead and even years that we will be able to rebuild. And we give you all the glory for that. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, certainly, if there are other folks who wish to speak, uh, feel free to do so. Um, hug each other. Be good to each other. Um, we're going to continue to grieve. Um, we've lost important members of our team and our community today. And from the bottom of my heart, uh, everything that I have goes out to their families. Um, they've paid the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. So. Thank you again for being here. Certainly feel free uh, to, to continue to share. Uh, but at this point in time, we'll just leave it to the community. So thank you for being here. The vigil light candle at Burnsville City Hall, well attended by both community members, law enforcement, fire, um, city manager spoke again as he did this afternoon. Uh, Angie Craig spoke as well. Uh, very poignant thoughts given by uh, the clergy. Um, and it's the, the first process, the first part of, of getting the city of Burnsville and all of their community members and all of us really to start the healing process. Yeah, I mean, it's just such an emotional toll that this has taken on the city of Burnsville, the police department, the fire department there, but then uh, just anybody who's a member of the community and anybody who's a member of the law enforcement community as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just, you can tell as the camera would pan the audience, the emotional toll that this was taking on the people uh, who would come out there tonight to just, um, just gather and that it, you don't need words. Uh, you just need to be shoulder to shoulder um, feeling that support in a time like this. And I think one of the things that was said over and over today uh, when people did speak was remember what your first responders do. Don't be afraid to thank them for their service. Um, it is those people that keep us all safe on a daily basis and we have to remember that every day they go to work uh, they can be put in situations like this where they're very unsafe. So uh, we're all reminded to remember that as we walk through our days. Our coverage uh, again at nine o'clock on Fox 9 will continue for our news at nine and 10. And just stay with Fox 9, fox9.com and Fox Local for updates. into our Fox 9 team as they continue to cover this very fully there just south of the Twin Cities. Those three individuals tragically losing their lives. Let's take you right back out because I still have this camera uh, up and it is live right here on live now from Fox's. You heard some of the people speak. You see some of the candles, some of the flowers there to pay tribute, to pay homage to Matthew Ruge, Adam Finseth, Paul Elmstrand. They also mentioned the other officer that was currently in the hospital right now getting treatment. Uh, after there an injury on the scene of this as well. So those four tragically losing their lives, uh, another one injured uh, in the line of duty at this domestic call. Don't know a ton of information about uh, what led up to this or exactly what transpired inside that home. We were hearing from uh, officials there talking about uh, what happened and we don't know a ton of more information. All right, I'm Andy Mack. This is a story we're gonna continue to follow here on Live Now from Fox. Let's slide away for a quick two minute break.
All right, welcome back in here to you live now from Fox, a live picture there in Burnsville, Minnesota, as we continue our coverage of the two officers that were tragically killed and the EMT slash firefighter also slain in the line of duty earlier today. Uh, early this morning, res responding to a barricaded suspect with a uh, mother also and seven children between the ages of two and five inside. Of course, the suspect was shot and killed, but not after an altercation with police. Two police officers killed, one EMT slash firefighter also killed. So we're following this very closely here on Live Now from Fox. All right. Let's continue on here on Live Now from Fox. Shift gears a little bit to the South Carolina primary that is now less than a week away. Of course, the two candidates, two potential nominees, the former president Donald Trump there dealing with a whole host of legal problems and Nikki Haley there certainly trying to gain ground in her home state. For more on this, let's go out to Alexandria Hoff with this preview. According to the latest Monmouth University poll, former Governor Nikki Haley is 26 percentage points behind former President Trump here in the state. Last night in Michigan, the dominating GOP contender rallied and spoke little of South Carolina and Haley, focusing a bulk of his remarks on his ongoing legal battles, including Friday's $355 million judgment against him in his civil fraud trial. The case is a complete and total sham. It's a sham case. There were no victims, no defaults, no damages, no complaints, no nothing. While Trump said last night that combating legal weaponization will be his top priority in the White House, Haley feels that there are more pressing issues for voters. She is crisscrossing her home state this week with the goal of an at least competitive showing in Saturday's open primary. In recent days, Haley has hit Trump on foreign policy, calling him out for stating that Russia should, quote, do whatever the hell they want to NATO members who don't spend enough on defense. Why is Trump siding with Putin? It's a problem. And that, for everybody in South Carolina, for military families, what are you doing to encourage war? Because Putin feels very emboldened when you say something like that. And our allies feel very weakened when you say that. And so Trump owes us an answer. South Carolina Senator and Trump advocate Tim Scott offered a rebuttal today on Fox News Sunday. Here's what I can tell you about Donald Trump and foreign policy. Without any question, the resources necessary to protect this world, a part of, as according to the NATO alliance, those resources went up under Donald Trump because of his, his language. The former president is set to arrive in the state on Tuesday. In Columbia, South Carolina, Alexandria Hoff, Fox News. Thank you so much. And we're going to be covering it very, very closely here on Live and Now from Fox. Of course, we heard from the former president last night. Today, it was Nikki Haley's turn to hit the campaign trail. She was at various different events, including in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Let's take you out to her comments here on Live Now from Fox. Carolina for sure thank you so much for coming out you know whenever when I was governor and we're gonna talk about all the fun things we did together one of the things I'm so proud of is when you can spot someone who's gonna be a fighter when you can spot someone who's gonna really work for the people and stay true to who they are when you can spot them and you can lift them up and say we need to see you do more I am incredibly proud of the second I supported Wes Clymer for Senate. He has been a fantastic senator. Where'd you go, Wes? There you are. He fights for you. He represents you. But I love everything I think should be transparent. And he believes in transparency. And he believes in making sure that everything is there for you to see. So thank you, Wes, for doing a great job. And boy, what a freedom fighter you've got in Ralph Norman. D.C. doesn't get anything past Ralph. I mean, they don't. And Ralph, I've told you before, I can't wait till I get there and see what we do together, because it's going to be a lot of fun. So how many of you were not here when I was governor? Raise your hand. Welcome to the best state in the country. 
you, I want to remind you about where we came from and what we did. Because when I came into office, South Carolina was hurting. We had 11% unemployment. We had thousands of people on welfare. And South Carolina was the butt of the jokes. But what did we do? We rallied and we got together. And by the time I left, we were building planes with Boeing. We were building more BMWs than any place in the world. We brought in Mercedes Benz. We brought in Volvo, five international tire companies. And yes, they were referring to us as the beast of the Southeast, which I still love. We moved that unemployment rate from 11% down to 4%. We announced jobs in every county in the state. We moved 35,000 people from welfare to work. We had the first body camera bill in the country. We did tort reform. We did pension reform. We cut taxes. We built up our coffers, and we acknowledged some truths. We said, if you've got to show picture ID to buy Sudafed, You've got to show picture ID to get on a plane. You should have to show picture ID to protect the integrity of the election process. We passed voter ID in South Carolina. We passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country. President Obama sued us over it, and we won. And by the time I left, we were named the friendliest state in the country. The one I love, the most patriotic state in the country. And don't blame me for this one, but we were named the number two state in the country people were moving to. And now I'm running for president. It's been a year since I announced, and what a roller coaster it's been. We had 14 people in the race. We defeated a dozen of the fellas. I just got one more I've got to catch up to. give us a chance in Iowa. We started at 2%. We finished almost second at 20%. Then we went to New Hampshire. They said we were 30 points down in the polls, and we came in at 43%. And, and on that night, Donald Trump had a temper tantrum. Did y'all see it? He was completely unhinged because he didn't know we were going to get 43% of the vote. And all he did was talk about revenge and my dress. <laughs> then the next day he goes and says, anybody that supports her is barred permanently from MAGA. <laughs> now think about that. If you're running for president of the United States, you want more people. It's a story of addition. You don't push people out of your club. You bring people in. Then the next day, he goes and tries to push the RNC to name him the presumptive nominee after just two states had voted. We don't anoint kings in America. We said the people of South Carolina deserve the right to vote, as do all the other states. He got pushback. And then we went and saw his campaign disclosures. And that's when we saw he spent $50 million of his campaign contributions on his personal court cases. Then he gets a judgment on a court case and he talks about how much of a victim he is. But the point I'm getting to this is whether it was the night of New Hampshire when he talked about revenge whether it was after the first court judgment when he talked about being a victim. What bothers me the most is at no point did he ever talk about the American people. He never talked about the fact that we're $34 trillion in debt. 
He never talked about the fact that only 31% of eighth graders in our country are proficient in reading. He never talked about the fact that we have an open border that is inexcusable and lawless. He never talked about all of the lawlessness in our cities. He didn't talk about the wars that are happening around the world. All he, bless you, all he did was talk about himself. And that's the problem. This isn't about him. What we need to be talking about is what American families are feeling. And right now, yes, we are $34 trillion in debt. We're having to borrow money just to make our interest payments. China owns some of that debt. For the first time, we're paying more in interest payments than we are in our defense budget. You know who's noticing that? Russia, China, and Iran. And I would love to tell you that all that debt was from Joe Biden. But I have always spoken to you in hard truths, and I'm gonna do that with you tonight. Our Republicans did that to us too. First, you look under Donald Trump. We can talk about what a good economy it was, but at what cost? He put us $8 trillion in debt in just four years. He says that's COVID. That wasn't all COVID. That was less than 25%. He grew government, and he spent it on things that we didn't need to be spending it on. But you also look at what they did when they passed that $2.2 trillion COVID stimulus bill with no accountability. They expanded welfare that left us with 80 million Americans on Medicaid, 42 million Americans on food stamps. That's a third of our country. And did Republicans try and make it right? Nope, they doubled down and opened up pet projects and earmarks for the first time in 10 years, passing through 7,000 of them last year. In the 2024 appropriations budget, Republicans put in $7.4 billion worth of pet projects. Democrats put in $2.8 billion. Now you tell me who the big spenders are. All while one in six American families can't afford their utility bill, 60% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck, 50% of American families can't afford diapers, Something's got to give. So how are we going to fix our economy? The way we're going to do it is we're going to start by clawing back the $100 billion of unspent COVID dollars that are still sitting out there. Then we're going to go, instead of 87,000 IRS agents going after middle America, we're going to go after the hundreds of billions of dollars of COVID fraud. One out of every $7 was spent fraudulently. <laughs> If 8% of our budget is interest, quit borrowing. Cut up the credit cards. You have to balance a budget every day. I had to balance a budget as governor. Why is Congress the only group that refuses to balance a budget? We'll stop the spending. We'll stop the borrowing. We'll eliminate their pet projects. And I will veto any spending bill that doesn't take us back to pre-COVID levels. That will save us trillions. Then we're going to take as many federal programs as we can and send them down to the states. That will dramatically reduce the size of the federal government, but it will empower people on the ground. Think education, think health care, think welfare, think mental health. If we cut those strings and send that money back, you can customize it to the states and not have Washington bureaucrats making those decisions. And we need to open up the middle class in America. We're watching the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So we're going to cut taxes on the middle class and simplify the brackets. We're going to eliminate the federal gas and diesel tax in this country. And we're going to make small business tax cuts permanent. They made corporate tax cuts permanent. We're going to make small business tax cuts permanent. Small businesses are the heartbeat of our economy. We need to start acting like it. Right. But you know, Congress just has one job. 
one job, and that's to give us a budget on time. Do you know Congress has only given us a budget on time four times in 40 years? Four times in 40 years. You know what I say about that? They don't give us a budget on time, they don't get paid, period. <laughs> and don't you think it's finally time we had term limits in Washington, D.C.? Don't you think we need to have mental competency tests for anyone over the age of 75? Now, I'm not being disrespectful when I say that. We all know people who are over 75 that can run circles around us. And then we know Joe Biden. Congress is now the most privileged nursing home in the country. But seriously, these are people making decisions on the future of our economy. These are people making decisions on our national security. We need to know they're at the top of their game. It's not a joking matter. And then, let's talk about the border. I can't believe this would happen in the United States. We have had eight and a half million illegal immigrants come across that border. We had more fentanyl cross the border last year that would kill every single American. Oh, Number one cause of death for adults 18 to 45, fentanyl. fentanyl. And don't think for a second China doesn't know what they're doing when they send it over. Now, when we passed the toughest illegal immigration law in the country, we knew what we were doing. So we're going to take what we did in South Carolina, and we're going to go national with it. We're going to do a national E-Verify program where every business has to prove that the people they hire are in this country legally. <laughs> we're going to defund sanctuary cities once and for all. No more safe havens in America. We'll put 25,000 Border Patrol and ICE agents on the ground and let them do their job. We're going to go back to the Remain in Mexico policy so that no one even steps foot on U.S. soil. And instead of catch and release, we're going to go to catch and deport. That is how you stop what happens on the border. And then growing up in rural South Carolina, my parents always taught us, you take care of those who take care of you. I'm going to ask you for taking care of those who take care of us. Right now in America, over 35,000 veterans are homeless. One in three suffers from PTSD or thoughts of suicide. We lose 22 heroes a day to suicide. If a veteran needs a doctor's appointment at the VA, on average, takes 29 days. Why 29 days? Because on the 30th day, they can go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. So midway through the 29 days, they get a call to reschedule, and the clock starts all over again. It's shameful how we treat our veterans. Now, I'm the proud wife of a combat veteran who served in Afghanistan. Y'all may remember he deployed when I was governor, and when he came back home to us, that was a lot of prayers answered. But that was the easy part. When we got home, life got hard. Michael couldn't hear loud noises. He couldn't be in crowds. Life had passed him by for the year that he was gone, and the transition was tough. We can't just love our men and women when they're gone. We got to love them when they come back home, too.
Let's do more than just the two-week transition. Let's take care of them for the long term. Let's do telehealth so they can get the mental health care they need right when they need it. They should be able to go to the doctor or hospital of their choice. They've earned that right. And I think the best way we deal with VA health care, I think every member of Congress should have to get their health care from the VA. And you watch how fast that gets fixed. Y'all know it, it'll be the best health care we've ever seen, guaranteed. <laughs> and then let's talk about our national security. The world is on fire, literally. You've got a war in Europe, you've got a war in the Middle East, you've got North Korea testing intercontinental ballistic missiles capable of hitting the US. You've got China on the march. But make no mistake, none of that would have happened had we not had that debacle in Afghanistan. The idea that Michael and his military brothers and sisters who served there had to watch us leave Bagram Air Force Base in the middle of the night without telling our allies who stood shoulder to shoulder with us for decades because we asked them to be there. Think about what that said to our friends. More importantly, think about what that said to our enemies. And when you think about allies and enemies, what you say matters. And what Donald Trump said a week ago was dangerous. He said that any NATO countries that weren't pulling their weight, that America would not defend them. But he doubled down and said, not only would he not defend them, he said any NATO countries that weren't pulling their weight, he would encourage Vladimir Putin to invade them. <laughs> Donald Trump is siding with a thug who just killed his political opponent like he's done many times before. Donald Trump just sided with a dictator who arrests American journalists and holds them hostage. Donald Trump just sided with a man where half a million people have died and been wounded because of the invasion in Ukraine. And he's gonna side with him over the allies who stood with us after 9-11? All that does is embolden Putin. Putin's not scared of Joe Biden. That's why he invaded Ukraine. But he's emboldened when someone running for president says, I will encourage those, I will encourage you to invade those that aren't pulling their weight. NATO has been a 75 year success story. It's why we haven't had wars. Russia has been intimidated by that alliance. China is intimidated by that alliance. Do we want them to pull their weight and pay their fair share? Absolutely, but you talk about that behind closed doors, not in front of your enemies, ever. <laughs> Because don't ever forget China's waiting in the wings, and that's our number one national security threat. But then he doubled down, and he mocked my husband's military service. Now, I will be the first one to tell you, Michael and I are fine. We don't take this personally, because when you're in politics, it's a blood sport, it's fair game. But you mock one member of the military, you're mocking every member of the military. And what bothered me about that is it's a pattern. We can no longer say it was an accident. He said anybody that lost their lives serving was a loser or a sucker. Then he said at Arlington National Cemetery, his question was what was in it for them? And now he does this. The thing is, he's never been around a veteran. We all know people who have served. We know people who've lost their lives. He's never been near a uniform. He's never had to lay on the ground. The closest he's come to harm's way is a golf ball hitting him on his golf course. <laughs> so that leads us to our decision. On Saturday, 
we head to the polls. And when we head to the polls, let's look at what everybody's saying. Everybody's telling me, why don't you just get out? I will never give up. Why would I give up when 70% of Americans have said they don't want Trump or Biden in this election? Why would I give up when 59% of Americans say Donald Trump is too old and Joe Biden is too old? Why would I give up when the majority of Americans disapprove of Joe Biden and a majority of Americans disapprove of Donald Trump? It is time we finally have a new generational conservative leader. We need to put the negativity and the baggage behind us and focus on the solutions that we can take forward. But to do that, let's look at the hard truths here. And I'll give mine. I voted for Donald Trump twice. I was proud to serve America and his administration. But the truth is, chaos follows him. It just does. And we can't be a country in disarray and a world on fire and go through four more years of chaos. We won't survive it. The other thing is, we all want to see our country turned back around, right? Well, guess what? We can't fix our country if we don't win. And Donald Trump cannot win a general election. You look at the record. He lost it for us in 2018. He lost it for us in 2020. He lost it for us in 2022. But look at last week. He loses another case on immunity. Now he's going to be tried as citizen Trump. Republicans lost a vote on Israel. They lost a vote on Mayorkas and the border. The RNC chair lost her job. And Donald Trump's fingerprints were all over all of that. How many more times do we have to lose before we finally figure out that he's the problem? And don't take my word for it. Look at the general election polls. In every one of those polls, Trump is down from Biden by five points, by seven points. On his best day, it's margin of error. It's equal. I'm in every one of those same general election polls, and I defeat Biden by up to 17 points. The latest poll, Marquette poll, was covering Wisconsin. Trump doesn't beat Biden, and I win in Wisconsin by 15 points over Biden. You win by that much. That's bigger than presidency. That's House. That's Senate. That's governorships. That's school boards. But you win by double digits. That's a mandate going into D.C. to stop the wasteful spending and get our economy back on track. That's a mandate to get our kids reading again and go back to the basics in education. That's a mandate to secure our borders with no more excuses. That's a mandate to bring law and order back to our cities. And that's a mandate for a strong America that prevents wars that we can all be proud of. Don't you want that? Because we could have that. But in order to have that, it's going to take a lot of courage. Courage from everybody here tonight. Courage for me to run. And courage for every one of you to know, don't complain about what happens in a general election if you don't vote in this primary. It matters. You know, I saw a commercial on TV that Trump was running. If he's not so worried, I don't know why he's got commercials on TV against me. (laughs) And in that, he said I was for open borders and raising taxes. (laughs) But this is what I'll say. He's going to lie about me. 
I'm going to tell you the truth about him. Look it up. When he was president in 2018, he proposed a 25 cent per gallon gas tax increase on all of us. He now wants to raise taxes on every single family. He wants to put a 10% tariff on everything that comes into this country, from baby strollers to appliances. Every family would have to pay over $2,800 more per year. He's saying with Social Security, he's not going to touch it, so that when he leaves, everybody gets a 24% cut in their benefits. That's the truth. And so we need to start saying, what is it that we're electing? Because we've got a decision to make. Do we want more of the same or do we want something new? More of the same is not just Joe Biden. Bless you. More of the same is also Donald Trump. And can't we do better than two 80-year-old candidates running for president? <laughs> We need to know we're going to have someone who can put in eight years of hard work, no drama, no vendettas, just getting the job done. That's what America deserves. You know, seven months ago, I dropped Michael off at 4 a.m. for another year-long deployment. And I watched him and 230 soldiers pick up their two duffel bags of belongings to go to a country they've never been, all in the name of protecting America. They're willing to sacrifice their lives and their families because they still believe in this amazing experiment that is America. So if they're willing to sacrifice for us there, shouldn't we be willing to fight for America here? Because we have a country to save. So if we're going to save her, we've got to fight for her. You know, when I announced, they asked me why I was running. And I said, my parents came here 50 years ago to an America that was strong and proud and full of opportunities. I want them to know that country again. I'm doing this for Michael and his military brothers and sisters. They need to know their sacrifice matters. They need to know that we love our country. I'm doing this for my daughter, who just got married, who is over here. <laughs> And I saw how hard it was for her and Josh to buy a home. The average home buyer in America now is 49 years old. The American dream is leaving them. And I'm doing this for my son, who is also over here. And he's a senior in college, and I am tired of watching him write papers of things he doesn't believe in just to get an A. That's not us. That's not America. And the first time, 81% of Americans don't think their kids are going to live as good of a life as we did. We can't be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. We do have a country to save. But I started this with what we accomplished together and all our success stories. But I'm also going to remind you of the challenges we went through. We went through Walter Scott, who was shot eight times in the back by a dirty cop. We went through a school shooting. We went through hurricanes, multiple. We went through a thousand year flood. We went through winter storms. And we went through a horrific shooting in a church where we lost, lost nine amazing souls. Any one of those, we could have fallen apart. And after that church shooting, we had seen cities go up in flames. Ferguson had been the most recent, had happened. But what did we do? We didn't split up and divide. We came together. We didn't have protests. We had vigils. We didn't have riots. We had prayer. And we brought down a divisive symbol that had separated us for a long time.
And why did that happen? It happened because the tone at the top matters. I didn't judge either side in that situation. I didn't say a side was right or a side was wrong. A leader doesn't divide their people. A leader brings out the best in their people. Can you imagine if we did that for our country where we can actually have dinner with our family members and not fight? Can you imagine where we could go to work and say what we think and not worry about being demoted? Can you imagine where our kids don't have to live in fear? And can you imagine where we don't have this atmosphere of anger and chaos all around us? Because this isn't about us. It's about our kids and our grandkids. They don't deserve what's happening right now. If you look at the chaos that they feel, you look at what they went through with COVID and the anger that's fallen. All they do is see the debt that's been put down and they wonder how that's going to impact them. They see that they don't know that they'll ever be able to hold, own a home or have a job. That's why we're doing this because we need to show them normal again. And we can do that in a way that only South Carolina knows how to do it. So this is what I need you to do. I need you to vote early. All right, girlfriend, if you voted early, I need you to take five people a day back to vote again. <laughs> Election day is on Saturday. I need you to leave with a yard sign. If you live in a neighborhood where you can't have a yard sign, put it in the back of your car. I need you to go to NikkiHaley.com, offer to volunteer, offer to help, donate, whatever you can do. I need you to go tell everybody you know that it's important to vote. Your family members and your friends, you'd be shocked at how many of them are just general election voters. In a general election, we're given a choice. In a primary, we make our choice. This is the chance for us to make our choice. And don't listen to the media and what they're saying about what's going to happen in South Carolina. They did that to me in Iowa. They did that to me in New Hampshire. And we're all going to be laughing when they do that to us in South Carolina. Because at the end of the day, we have a country to save. And if we all go out and do our part, my promise to you is exactly what my promise was to you when I was governor. I will spend every single day primed, trying to prove to you that you made a good decision. Thank you very much, Rock Hill. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. And our beautiful children's workers, thank you all so much for what you do. Well, Monica mentioned Bruce. Bruce Alpe is a head of our security here. I'll say this in the right sense, not braggingly, but let me tell you, the security plan worked. You know, this person never got into the auditorium, a lot of other things. I won't go into all the details, but we believe, you know, again, we believe in the power of God, but God gives us wisdom and understanding. He gives people skill and expertise, and God's allowed us to hire some of the best people in the world. When the Super Bowl was here in town a few years back, uh, Mr. Bruce Alpe was in charge of all the Super Bowl security for the FBI. Well, a couple of years ago, Bruce came on board with us, and he's done a fantastic job. His partner, Alvin, as well. Thank you, Mr. Bruce, and Alvin Richardson, too. We, we honor you guys, and thank you for your service and your sacrifice, and uh, you guys are awesome. Let me tell you, <laughs> I tell you, <laughs> we're going to, thank y'all. Y'all have a, y'all are like me, you have a heart of gratitude, but be seated because you're going to stand again in a minute, but anyway. Because we're going to bring up all, a bunch of the, a bunch of them, but there were, and he'll mention there were a couple of them. These, these, these are heroes. I'm telling you, if you know the story, it's people that use their God-given talents. Courage rose up in them. They fought fear, and they saved us all. And so it starts with you guys, the leaders, and we honor you today. But thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Pastor. I hope I can adequately convey how much Lakewood Church cares about everybody in this building. They care about your safety. For us in security, it's a calling. There's a couple of groups that I would like to recognize, and if you, you would you'd hold your applause. But on behalf of Alvin Richardson, our assistant security director, Robin Smith, Ruby Paradis, there were some security officers in the immediate aftermath that played key roles. Supervisory security officer, Ashley Harris. Supervisory security officer, Danny Butte. Their assistance was invaluable in the immediate aftermath. We have a great group of medical professionals that accompany us to each service and everywhere we go. They performed admirably. Next, we have a group of ministry assistants. The MAs are an integral part of our security program. The MAs prefer to operate in the shadows. They quietly serve without recognition, but today they're all in front of you. And these are the ones that serve you. Sunday. These guys, all of them, thank you. The the Houston Police Department's response was swift, it was courageous, and it was effective. They were assisted by Harris County Sheriff's deputies came, Houston Fire Department came and responded as well, and they assisted the HPD SWAT team in rendering the area safe so that we could safely evacuate. Lakewood employees and volunteers, we train on an annual basis for critical incidents like this. While we may have a plan and we may train and we may have exercises, it's just to prepare us. But if it was not for the heroic actions of TABC off-duty officer, Adrian Herrera and HPD's Christopher Marino, they're the ones that helped us to get past this. They were heroes. In the face of danger, they went to evil and good prevailed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bruce. Thank you so much. We appreciate y'all. They were heroes. Gentlemen, stay with us if you don't mind. Can I invite Mayor Whitmire up and, and Chief Fender? Come on up, gentlemen, if you don't mind. Very honored to have the new mayor of Houston, Texas, Mayor Whitmire. Mayor, thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you for serving our city, and we're honored. You, you, you all, and, and the, the whole city, and the fire department, all of y'all, y'all make us feel so at home and so safe here, and we just thank you for, all, for what you do. Thank you, Pastor, and I want to thank the God 
for bringing us together to allow us to praise him and to thank so many first responders. You know, you never question God's will, but certainly after the tragedy of last week, he had a purpose in bringing us together to show how united our city is. And let's not forget that. I must spend my time to thank our first responders. I was on the scene and to watch these professionals come together, assure everyone that they were safe and Houston and its surrounding communities was safe because our first responders were doing their job. Thank you, Chief Finner, Chief Nucci, our EMS. Thank you, Pastor Osteen, for being on the scene and comforting us. Let me close by saying thank you for allowing me to be in this service. I feel the Holy Spirit as I stand before you. I know what the Holy Spirit feels like. And I feel it. Show it. I will leave here. I will leave here a better father, a better Christian, and a better mayor than the one who got here. Thank you. Let's praise God. I love that. Man, I didn't know you could preach. I don't have enough time to pray to, to preach today. But if he'll have a guest minister, I'm 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 ready. Thank you. I love that. Oh, that's so good, Mayor. That's so good. Man, we have him, we don't have to use a sound system. Chief. Thank you. You know how God works. I was talking to Chief earlier, Mayor. Um, my mom and I, we go, we go out to dinner every Monday night after my radio show, and my mom likes to go to a certain cafeteria that we love, and, and Chief goes over there a lot of times. Oh, y'all can be seated. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Chief is over there a lot of times. So I've got to know him over the last few years, and we always go to the cafeteria, and the first thing my mother says, I wonder if the Chief is here. <laughs> and then we'll find the Chief, but we've got to visit and talk. But I'm telling you, He's not just an, uh, an exceptional, you know, man of law enforcement, but he's an exceptional man and father and, and just a, a friend of ours and a friend of this city. And like I said, when this incident happened, the first text I got was from the police chief. And I thought, wow, you know what? That's somebody that, you know, that, that cares. But, you know, guys, you, you made us feel at home. Thank you so much, Thank chief. You. We love you. Thank you so much. And uh, give an honor to God. Thank y'all. I know my mayor was a man of God, but I didn't know he was a preacher. So I don't, I don't know how I follow that. <laughs> but none of us have the answers to uh, what God allows to happen sometimes. But I can tell you this, and I want you to think about this. When has he ever brought us through any difficult time and did make us better and stronger as a people? And that's what Lakewood is about. That's what the city of Houston is about. I'm so proud of everyone, all the security teams, all of our first responders. But in a few days, we're gonna release the videotape. And I'm gonna tell you, you're gonna be proud of it. And you're not gonna be able to understand everything because it's, it's just a snippet of what happened. But when God put men and women in place to protect people, that's what happened on last Sunday. And when I first got the calls, Pastor, and you know the prank calls and the swatting calls that come in, but this one was for real, and I knew it right off. And I was grabbing my stuff, trying to get together, and I say, let me pause. And let me call and check on our pastor, but my brother. And also, I thought about my mother in this entire congregation. But what was amazing, the reach that Lakewood has, Immediately, I start getting calls and texts from chiefs all over the nation asking about, hey, how is Lakewood doing? How are y'all doing? That's the beauty, and that's the reach that y'all have. And I want to just say, claim this right now. This incident is making us stronger, but I want us to pause for just a second. Little Samuel, an innocent little seven-year-old boy, Make sure that we continue to pray every moment for he and his family. 
because they are hurting and everybody that's involved. But continue to pray for our first responders. And I know one thing for sure, factual. God is going to have us strong, standing stronger as a city, as a congregation, as a department, everything. And the final thing and the most important thing, God commanded us all and he gave us a spirit, a gift of forgiveness. Don't ever forget about that. As we move through pain, we have to forgive people. And all he's asking us to do is stand up and love one another and pray for one another. And even if you're, they're different, that's the message. And thank y'all so much for inviting me in. I want to thank those officers, that TABC agent, Agent Herrera, and our officer, Morena. Thank you so much and everybody for what you did because I can tell you as chief, in almost 34 years, I've seen so much. And if that person would have gotten into the sanctuary, it would have been a mass. It was a shooting incident that people stepped up. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Come on, y'all. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much for being with us. Can y'all tell the mayor and the chief how much we love them? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let's all stand, and if you don't mind, let's, let's, let's do something. I'm going to ask you something a little bit unusual. Do you mind joining hands with each other? And, you know, I just thought it'd be a good time to rededicate this building to God. I know we did it back in 2005 when we moved in, but let's just, let's just rededicate it. Lord, we know you gave us this building. It was a basketball arena, but Lord, you turned it over to us. And I know, Lord, we're standing on holy ground right now. This is not just an ordinary building. This is a place that you gave us to bring hope to the world and healing to our community and help us to, to walk in your way. So, Lord, we commit it back to you. We thank you for your protection. We thank you for watching after us. Thank you for Officer Adrian and Moreno and, Lord, all these others. And, Lord, we know it was your spirit in them rising up big. So, Lord, we recognize that, and we also recognize your angels watching after us. You brought us 65 years down the road. Lord, I thank you there's another great 65 years ahead. We commit, Lord, to walk humbly and holy before you. The Lord, you've entrusted us to to carry a lot of influence, to speak to the world, to help our community. And we don't take that lightly. And Lord, like Paul said, we put down another uh, a memorial stone to, to worship you on this Sunday. One week after that incident, it could have been so much worse, but your hand of mercy and favor. Lord, we know it wasn't a lucky break. Uh, you were watching after us. And so, Lord, we all put your first place in our lives right now. And we thank you, Lord.
eligible for the 66th running of the Daytona 500, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. As you guys may have heard, he has agreed to stick around with us tomorrow, so you are going to get him get to hear him do the command tomorrow with us. Can't wait. All right, DJ, I'm going to start off with you. You've had one of the most prolific careers in entertainment, from your success in the WWE ring to your role now with the, the UFL. What is the most exciting thing you're working on right now? Uh, first of all, it's good to see everybody. Good to be here. This is my first time uh, at uh, in, in Daytona. Um, as many of you may or may not know, I'm a Florida boy, right down the road, University of Miami, best college in Florida. There you go. <laughs> we got one. <laughs> I was looking to get a reaction to that. Um, so it's great to be here. Uh, I would say the most exciting thing that I have going on right now is being the Grand Marshal for the Daytona 500. It's awesome. Um, I, you know, when you are just a sports fan, uh, something like this really becomes an honor and a privilege. So I'm a lucky guy to be in this position in my career to uh, to have been asked to be the Grand Marshal and, and say those four iconic words. Um, much different than the words I usually hear, which is, honey, don't do that. Um, but uh, super excited about it. And, um, I, and also, too, I think just a little bit... Um, a little bit deeper into the into my answer is uh, what I try to do is I try to make sure that everything I do these days in my career, because I've been really lucky and blessed to have a pretty good career over the years um, that have spanned a lot of industries, is I just try to make sure that everything I'm doing is the most exciting thing that I'm doing. I got babies at home, and being a daddy is my favorite role, so I want to make sure that I'm using my time wisely in anything that I do, whether it's in the UFL or movies or back in professional wrestling, which is always my first love, uh, or being the Grand Marshal here uh, for Daytona 500. I just want to make sure that it's the thing that I love to do. So I, I always, I'm a big advocate, and I always tell people that, um, you know, if you could create that life for yourself where if you decide to do something, you want to make sure that it's the thing that gets you out of bed and you run towards it. So that's what I'm doing. And you recently were able to make 21 wishes come true with the Make-A-Wish Foundation, um, an organization that we're really close to here at DIS as well. That had to have been really special for both you and the kids. What was that moment like for you? It, it was. Uh, Make-A-Wish is a very special organization, as we all know. And I know you guys work very closely with Make-A-Wish. The drivers work very closely with Make-A-Wish. It, it is an organization that I hold very close to my heart and my soul and, and, and deep in my bone marrow. I had an opportunity when I was 25 years old to grant my first wish, and that was about 8,000 years ago. And it was very special then, and since then I've, I've had the privilege of granting hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of wishes. And uh, it, it's the reminder, I think, for me certainly, but I feel like it's a reminder for all of us that, man, every life is special, every life has a purpose, every life has a meaning, and I like to say... And I'm sure you guys have participated in Make-A-Wish events that, you know, as we know, those children and those kids, they're the real heroes. And I always like to say that their parents and their loved ones are the real rock stars because everybody goes through that challenge, man. So, um, but it, it was an honor. And by the way, we, we did. We did one of the biggest Make-A-Wish events uh, in the history of Make-A-Wish. We did 21 Make-A-Wish kids. We did it in Los Angeles, and it was an incredible day. What what turned what was supposed to be all right? I'm going to spend a couple of hours and then move on. Uh, I got to go on to my next thing. Wound up being a big like an eight nine hour day, and it was very very special. That's awesome. And now, moving ahead to tomorrow, the spectacle of the Great American Race. What are you hoping to experience when we finally get out there? And and what are you planning for your command to fire the engines tomorrow? Um, well, what I'm hoping to experience is what I have already been experiencing i got a little selling frank i got a little uh kooky last night because i couldn't sleep and i went to the gym at midnight and i drove by this uh by the speedway and all the lights were on and you just immediately felt the energy there's a word i like to use called mana and it's uh it means spirit and it's power and it, you, mana is ever present and it comes from in here and you just you felt the mana as i was driving by the speedway so what I hope to experience is, is really what I have been experiencing, which is just this incredible electric energy. And also, you know, you, 
I liken it to my world of professional wrestling where uh, there's a lot of people and the fans are so incredibly passionate and the greatest part about being a performer is that you get to connect with the audience, you get to connect with the fans. And I think my math is kind of shady, but I think it's about 101,500 is the sellout, which is really cool. So I, I, I want to experience that. And I want to experience that tomorrow. And I know I'm going to experience this. This is why I didn't want to leave. I had to stay so I can experience that. And my plan for the iconic words of driver start your engine is just not to screw it up. That's all. And maybe sound halfway cool when I do it. But also, I really want to make sure that um, my words and my energy is a, a reflection and a respectful reflection of what the drivers need from me and also what the fans need to kick the race off and, and to certainly kick the season off. So that's what I hope. Awesome. Well, we have a couple of minutes for a couple of questions, so we'll open up if you raise your hand. Uh, we're going to start up front here with Kelly Crandall. Kelly Crandall, Racer.com. I want to talk professional, racing, uh, professional wrestling. We have our biggest race tomorrow, WrestleMania the biggest event for you all. Yeah. A couple of years ago, that shifted to a two-day show. And I'm really curious, how has that been a benefit of, for both the product and the fans yeah. that, that get to attend and watch those two nights? That's a great question. So for those of you who didn't know, um, as Ke Kelly, right? Is it? Um, she had said, we have, we've extended WrestleMania, which was for years and years, uh, one day. Now we've extended it to two. And it's worked out really wonderfully. I think on the business side for us and our sponsors and our partners, um, it works out great. Uh, the economics, you hope, work out good for us, again, on the business side. But I, I think perhaps more importantly than that is uh, the fans get an opportunity to enjoy two days of the Super Bowl, if you will, and enjoy great matches, great entertainment. And, uh, and, and also, in addition to that, uh, we get to create more opportunities for the wrestlers and for the performers. And I grew up in the world of wrestling. For those of you who don't know, I was born into it. My grandfather wrestled, my dad, my cousins. My grandmother was the first promoter in Hawaii. I mean, that, so I come from a long lineage. So creating opportunity for wrestlers and performers is something that um, is very important to me and important to us as a company. So uh, I can't wait. In this WrestleMania, WrestleMania 40, we look to put on hopefully the biggest WrestleMania of all time. I am returning into the ring, so I'm going to put the spandex on, uh, and I got to start my diet, and <laughs> and, um, and, I, and I and I can't wait. I think we are creating something that should be, I think, pretty cool for the fans and pretty entertaining. Along those same lines, this program now that you're talking about leading a WrestleMania, how different and how meaningful has it been to really le to to really lean into that family lineage that you've that you just talked about because it's been mentioned throughout your career but i i, I can't recall this you guys are really into it now and, and using that with roman and cody that's right so in, in our world of uh, wwe we are we're really leaning into as kelly was saying um with our heels and baby faces that's parlance for good guys bad guys bad guys the rock uh, the Big Bad Wolf, The Rock, Denny Hamlin, for example, uh, <laughs> which I love. We'll get to in a second. Um, and, and so we decided to really lean into the idea of families and lineage and uh, culture. And when you think about it, it's, it's pretty cool when you look at the family tree. I, I, as I was saying, I, I grew up in the world of professional wrestling, but when you look at the actual family tree of Maivia, Johnson, on Hawaii, uh, it's pretty spectacular and it's pretty cool. Again, and just creating more and more opportunities for not only my family, which I'm incredibly grateful for, but for other wrestlers too and other performers. Thank you. We'll go to Alan Cavana. Uh, Alan Cavana, Sirius XM NASCAR Radio. Uh, to the point of what you just mentioned, uh, one of the favorites to win this race is Denny Hamlin. Yeah. He could win and get booed by the crowd you're going through that right now <laughs> getting the booze what is that like is it more fun to get booed what is it like being the villain because right now one of our top stars in nascar kind of is the villain being the villain is the greatest thing in the world <laughs> it truly is now in my world of professional wrestling um and I, I was aware of danny and getting booed and also i think uh impressed in how he's embraced it so and I also feel like everybody wants to be the good guy, and everyone wants to be the good guy, the good girl. Everyone wants to be loved and cheered and considered the hero. 
which is great and it's natural. It's um, human psychology and desire. But I have felt in my career and through my experience that I've been very fortunate, knock on wood, to have is that um, the rare air is when you have the opportunity and you grab it by the throat and you don't let it go and that's the opportunity to be a great bad guy and in this case with me coming back to wwe for those of you who may not know uh the character of the rock has turned heel and i always say that the the best parts of the times that i played heel which is now is it always comes from a place of truth and i always think that that's really the the best and greatest bad guys and villains out there bad guys bad girls the villains are coming from a place of truth so um one of the cool things that being a great bad guy and a great villain offers um and this is my uh advice to denny is not only do you embrace it but also you get the opportunity to say and do a lot of things that people can't a lot of people wish they can uh, but they don't, so you don't have to. Let me and Denny do <laughs> do the talking and, and get the booze. Thanks for being here. Thank you, man. All right, well, we have to move on with DJ. We have a full slate of activities for him. But DJ, thank you so much for joining us today and for sticking around with us tomorrow. We can't wait to hear your command. Of course, yeah, I can't wait. Thank you guys very much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Tonight, live from the Fisher Center for the Performing Arts in Nashville, Tennessee, it's America Salute You presents A Concert for Gratitude. With performances from Clint Black, Chrissy Metz, Dustin Lynch, Joe D. Messina, Alana Springsteen, Megan Maroney, Walker Hayes, Charles Esten, Lecrae, War Hippies, and Lee Greenwood. With special performances from Craig Morgan, Jelly Roll, and Trace Atkins. And a special presentation to actor Gary Sinise. Welcome to the stage, Clint Black. Had a rocky start. Never certain it would last We nearly came apart But now that's all in the past We stood the test of time And though it doesn't seem that long 
We've towed the line for years now, and we're still going strong. You've got to know you're not alone. I'm still in love with you, in spite of all our ups and downs. We've gone our separate ways, but we've come back around. And even when we fight just a little or a lot when it comes to friends you're the best one that i've got and i'm still in love with you america i'll still stand beside you when we don't see eye to eye I'll help to guide you when you can't see the light and if fate again should find you with your back against the wall just let history remind you who will be answering the call you've got to know you're not still in love with you with all our ups and downs we've gone our separate ways but we come back to
I believe it's important for all of us, in whatever way we can, to let those who serve know that we don't take them for granted. For their families to know, because they have to wait and worry. They don't know what's going to happen. Uh, an EMT, firefighter, certainly those in the military being deployed overseas, the National Guard, the Coast Guard, all of them, uh, they all deserve our respect, and they deserve to hear it from us. If you see someone in a in an airport or a train station, you know, walk up to them, thank them. They deserve it. Coming up next, Dustin Lynch and Chrissy Metz. We have these holidays throughout the year, scattered throughout the year, that um, I think everybody's used to shining light on those that serve. Um, but we got to remember that the guys and, and girls that serve uh, are around every day of the year. Took my love and I took it down. I climbed a mountain and I turned around. And I saw my reflection in the snow covered hills. The landslide brought me down. Oh, mirror in the sky, what is love? And can the child who's in my heart rise above? Can I sail through the changing ocean? So I've got this song about cowboys and angels, and I think this day and age, the men and women that protect our freedoms, those that have served, those that are currently serving, and those that will serve are the true cowboys, the true cowgirls, and the true angels of our lives. So this one goes out to all of them tonight. You guys know it, help me sing along. <laughs> <laughs> 